This market, I think, is trying to figure out, do we get some sort of soft landing? Does this work out? A lot of humility is in order as we go into the next few mm -hmm. months. We are seeing some elements of disinflation. Problem is, it's not happening very quickly. There's a long precedent for these cycles simply taking a long time. What we expect is that when the Fed does cut, they are going to be cutting fairly aggressively. Mm -hmm. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get your week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market just about positive by 0.3%. Talks will resume on the debt ceiling tomorrow between the Speaker of the House, Mr McCarthy, alongside President Biden, TK, and some soothing words over the weekend as well from Brainerd over the, the economy, Tom on the National Economic Council director saying this, the staff is very engaged. I would characterize the yeah. engagement as serious as constructive. That's the good news. That's exactly the process. And the key word here is staff. This is the people doing the really tough negotiations. What do we believe in? Where do we fit? What's most important to us? <coughs> and they're going to, excuse me, I'm gasping That's over the debt ceiling. <laughs> No, I'm gasping over the debt ceiling because nobody cares about it. But the answer is it's going to get done. And, and I would suggest, John, it's just a normal process to get there. I have to predict they'll kick the can down the road. We're hoping that we are making some progress. <clears throat> yeah. I think the president said over the weekend, Lisa, that we're not at the crunch point just yet. Secretary Yellen spoke to the team over in Japan at Bloomberg. I thought that was interesting that we think the X date might be in early June. We could get an update in the next couple of weeks. And there is a risk here, I think, a feeling amongst a lot of people that perhaps that comes forward a little bit. Well, the tax receipts were not particularly as fruitful as people had expected. $250 billion shortfall in terms of the tax revenues, which really creates uh, a bit of a crunch here and a bit of an ambiguity. I will say, can we just point out, the negotiations are continuing, making progress. They have until Wednesday when President Biden heads over to the G7 meetings. And then after that, everyone's on vacation forever because that's what happens in Washington, D.C. So they got to get something together. Vacation yeah, the, the forever, vacation TK. Is a <laughs> totally did they unreal. do that in England? Yes. John, did they do that in England? They do a little bit of that. Well, it doesn't feel bit, like they do as like anywhere here. near as much as they do down in There's Congress. There's a tradition no. here because they had to travel, John, and they all lived in the same hotels together. This is 150 years ago. There's a huge American tradition of they're literally on horseback or carriage all over the country, not as big to California. You, traveling, and that's where the schedule came from. And they've stuck with it. Stuck with it, even yeah. though you can fly. Even now. though, <laughs> yeah. they still no, that's now. true. You, you can fly now, but it's still vacation forever. Well, you know, it's a nice gig if you can get it. Okay, wonderful, wonderful start to the week. <laughs> Yeah. Let's get straight to the price <laughs> action. You don't want to continue this? Your equity market. I, I'd forgotten where Brain had worked yeah. for a moment. I was Federal Reserve. We haven't, we haven't, government. Hold on a I haven't heard from her. We haven't heard from her. Agreed. I thought it was interesting, and we heard from her, and it was very Agreed. Pol politically constructive. Didn't hear much from her when she was at the Federal Reserve either. Dare I say, we've heard too little of her so far at the administration. You've both gone quiet because you know where I'm going with this. Yes. We'd like to hear more from you. Dees played this game for a little while when he arrived in the administration at the very beginning. Yeah, very, very quiet, but, but didn't really talk much. I, eh, I don't think that's on. We, Not we, in a moment like this one. We want to hear more from Dr. Brainerd because of her academic chops. Mr. Deese was very good and got better on the job, which is a rare accomplishment in Washington. But people, whether they agree or disagree or they want to you know, there's like miscongeniality. She's miscumulative. Oh, cumulative I don't want academic thought leadership, TK. Forget that nonsense. I want to understand but, well, about policy. Well, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> I want to understand about policy. She's in a really important position in this yes. administration now. And she gave a little sense of that over the weekend. And I think that's the reason why there is this optimism, because she said that talks are actually quite constructive. And that really goes against this feeling that, that President Biden isn't going to negotiate unless everything is off the table in terms of really devolting. We should restart the show. Here's your equity market on the yeah, S&P 500. On Positive 0.3% <laughs> on the S&P. And the bond market <laughs> yields a little bit higher. Lisa, by a basis point, your 10-year, 347.94. Friday, you, Mitch. Wow. That market was, mover. It was a market mover because of the five to ten year expectations surging to, I believe, the highest going back to 2012. This is the concern here. Are we seeing inflation becoming unmoored? Not necessarily seeing some sort of concern in markets. What we're looking for today, 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. Empire uh, State Manufacturing Survey. Do we see uh, something roll over here in a more meaningful way? Last week we saw, or last uh, read, last month, we got a surprise to the upside. But we are seeing economic data slowly come in a little bit lower than expectations. At 11 a.m., 
a view on credit card spending ahead of retail sales tomorrow and then Home Depot as well as uh, Target and Walmart. The New York Fed is going to be releasing their first quarter household debt and credit report. I'm looking for total credit card outstanding. Basically, how much are people borrowing to keep this uh, spending spree going? And at 2 p.m., our own Michael McKee will be having a conversation with Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic from Amelia Island in Florida, which is gorgeous. And they're having a con <laughs> conference where they're going to talk about you know, the state of play, where we're at. Nice. You don't sound jealous at all. <laughs> it's so pretty. <laughs> Sebastian Page, head of global multi-asset and CIO at T. Road Price with us around the table. Good morning, Seb. Morning. We'll catch up with Stuart Kaiser of City in about an hour from now. He put out a note yesterday evening, and these are the numbers, the tail of the tape over the last three months. SPX up 1%, NASDAQ 100 up 8%, the Russell is down 11%, the equal weight S&P 500 6% lower. He called it a very odd pattern. Can you square that circle? Can you make that work for us? Can you explain it? Well, it's a continuation of what we've had year to date, a concentrated rotation into growth relative to what the market is starting to perceive as a peak rate environment. Right now, we're just talking about the debt ceiling. I think that's, I'm not sure, Tom, you actually want to talk about it, but it, it is important. And what I'm interested in is the difference between how the stock market is reacting to that debate versus the rest of the markets, the CDS and the bills. And there's a huge difference there, Jonathan. And look, Sebastian, at where we are on a Monday morning, you know, we sort of started the show clumsy because it's a really clumsy time. There's some international stories we'll get to. But the big one for me is if I take a three moving average log study, we're at stasis. Those moving averages have come in to a shocking point of two-tenths of a percent, 0 0.0024 differential in those rates. What do our listeners and viewers do when you have a convergence of this level? You know, I'm leaning towards the bond market view that we're in for some volatility. The VIX is sort of low, and then you look at the CDS, which you've talked about on the show on the U.S. government, it shows that the default risk for the U.S. is right now, according to the market, higher than Brazil's, Mexico's, Greece. It's twice what it was back in 2011. And you've talked about the T-bills, too. The one month is yielding 80 basis points more than the two month. No one wants to hold the T-bill into the debt ceiling. And the VIX is well, low, and the but, market is doing okay. Okay, so. so are you saying that the market should sell off, that basically stocks need to sell off in order to really represent the risk that you're seeing <clears throat> represented everywhere else in the market relating to the debt ceiling? I think the market could sell off. It did in 2011 by 17%. The interesting part of this is that it could be a tactical buying opportunity. You know, it, the next 12 months in 2011, the market was up 29%. So I think short term tactically could become a trade. Longer term, I think this debate, uh, you've talked about this as well, hurts fiscal spending, or you pull back on fiscal spending, you issue more bonds to replenish the Treasury's general account, that puts upward pressure. So it's it's one more negative for the economy. Okay, the problem with this argument, and this is why I think we're all frustrated and kind of in this muddle, is because that's what everyone says. This could potentially be a decline, which will be a buying opportunity so we can all get in, which is the reason why you're not seeing anything come down, because everyone's going to hang on tight until we get there. Where is the conviction in that risk-taking uh, kind of proposition? whether it's to sell or whether it's to buy at a time when Stuart Kaiser is talking about one of the most painful uh, volatility versus uh, downdraft that you've seen going back to the 1980s. Yeah, look, <clears throat> to be clear, in our asset allocation portfolios, we're underweight stocks, not by a lot, but we are positioned for pullbacks in markets. We take a 12-month horizon. I think of this whole situation as the four horsemen of a recession, right? You have the inverted yield curve, which is here. You have plummeting PMIs, which on the manufacturing side is down 17 points. Then you have credit tightening, the discussion on the sluice. That might be the new surveillance drinking game, how many times you sluice. say sluice. Oh, God and then you have the fourth horseman, which is unemployment, which is still not here, you're not still not seeing it in the data. So you put it all together, um, 
price earnings ratio in the S&P 500 at 18. I, again, I'm an asset allocator. In our committee, we have both bond and stocks investors. Right now, we're leaning towards the bond investor, a little, slightly more pessimistic view. So what you see on the horizon, better for bonds, bad for stocks. When you say underweight equities, what does that mean for you and T. Rowe Price? So in our asset allocation portfolios, we have some tactical levers we can pull. Um, we're pulling back on equities relative to bonds and putting some of it in cash, you know, because the yields on the short end of the curve are more interesting. So we're overall underweight stocks. The interesting part of this is that, you know, when you went through the market returns year to date and mentioned that small caps were not doing as well as large caps, for example, there are opportunities where I think valuations are pricing in a deep recession, hard landing scenario. Think high yield bonds for the total yield perspective and think quality small caps if they're managed by a skilled active manager. I think those are opportunities to lean back. So Jonathan, and on your question is, what does it mean? We're underweight stocks, not by a lot because we tend to be invested for the long term. Yeah. We're adding risk back in the portfolio through very, very contrarian positions here. Well, let's do a little bit more on that, the equity allocation within that underweight. Contrarian right now would be the regional banks. Are you leaning into any of that at all? We're overall close to neutral on regional banks. Uh, it's all about selection. I think this is when you want skilled active management involved. On the small cap side, we like quality small cap. So that might include some regional banks, but not all. Interesting. Seb, this was fantastic. Thank you, sir. Sebastian Page there of T. Rowe Price. Underweight equities, Brammer, but when you dig into it, selectively taking some risk there. Some people might say some big risk. Some big risk. It seems like everyone's all in PNC. This is what I'm hearing. I'm sorry. I don't know what your position is, but I'm just seeing this sort of feeling right now. Don't that... put him on camera right now. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, what I'm hearing is that people are going for the bigger regional banks and they're sort of, you know, parsing through all of this. This just shows that people want to take risk, even if they're putting more money in cash, which is the reason why some people think that there could be a painful bounce upside to the upside. Well, I think what you're suggesting with the debt ceiling in mind is that this needs to get worse before it gets better. And if it gets worse, that is the solution for it to get better. And ultimately, that's the buying opportunity, which is why you end up in this situation where you just go nowhere and you're playing this this game of chicken, this blinking contest with the S&P 500 it's fun. at the moment. It's really fun. You're loving it, aren't Love you? It. In, the, in the 14 stories this morning, a small matter. Sure. The regional banks, once again, can't get a bid. It's not drama, but PacWest can't get a bid this morning. That sort of surprises me. Regional was last week down more than yeah. 6%. S&P 500 down by something like 0.3%. Clearly just shaking off the drama elsewhere. Stuart Kaiser of City, I mentioned him a little bit earlier. We'll catch up with him in the next hour in about 50 minutes' time. If you're just waking up this morning, good morning to you all and welcome to the programme. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Equity Futures Positive, 0.29%. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Turkey, there could be a runoff in an election that's testing President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's two decades in power. Preliminary results show Erdogan with a lead of more than two million votes. But that's not enough to avoid a second round of voting. A runoff would pit Erdogan against Kemal Kilik Darulu, who has the backing of the nation's broadest ever grouping of opposition parties. In Thailand, a big victory for pro-democracy parties in Sunday's parliamentary elections. And that sets up the biggest challenge to the royalist-backed establishment since the military seized power in a coup nearly a decade ago. The Move Forward Party wants to change a law that restricts criticism of Thailand's powerful monarchy. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy meet again this week to try to break the impasse over raising the debt ceiling. Other congressional leaders will also take part in Tuesday's meeting. If the borrowing limit isn't raised, the U.S. could default on its debt. McCarthy has said any, chance to ch any change to the limit is contingent on a budget deal. In a big transaction in the oil pipeline business, One Oak has agreed to buy Magellan Midstream Partners in an $18.8 billion cash and stock deal. It would create one of the largest oil and natural gas pipeline operations in the U.S. The price represents a 22 percent premium to Magellan's closing price on Friday. Gold giant Newmont has agreed to pay $19.2 billion to buy an Australian rival Newcrest Mining. That consolidates its position as the world's largest bullion producer. The deal will also boost Newmont's resources of copper, a metal where demand is expected to outpace supply. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this 
Ms. Bloomberg. What I've learned a long time ago, and you know as well as I do, it's never as good to characterize a negotiation the middle of a negotiation. I remain optimistic because I'm a congenital optimist, but I really think there's a desire on their part as well as ours to reach agreement. I think we'll be able to do it. Sounds like a tough bike ride over the weekend for the President of the United States over in Delaware, TK, yesterday. Made a joke at the White House dinner about how often he's there. Like, it's like get out of Dodge at the White House. I don't know if it's get out of Dodge Thursday or get out of Dodge Friday. And in, in, in his defense, many other presidents have done the same mm, thing. Okay. Bramma? No. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. We're doing it all wrong. <laughs> we should be able to take off every, uh, every other week. You know, but in all honesty, everyone else is doing it in Washington, D.C. Who else is doing it? <clears throat> Congress is about to go back. Oh, Nick true. Bloom, true. Well, They're going to take a nice long vacation as well. Mm -hmm. Nick Bloom of Stanford is on the high ground on doing the math of work from home. And, you know, you look at look at President Biden, I guess he's doing work from home in Delaware. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's simple. The tech people are leading the way. And then the CEOs, the C-suite officers, are right behind them. Are we doing a work from home? And then they said, we're not doing that. work from home. We're not doing work from home. We're staff. We're, we're staff. staff. That's we're what staff. Nick Bloom, but they Professor Bloom would call us. Nice. We're staff. What we're going to do right now on a really odd Monday, and I think the odd Monday sets, and when's retail sales? Tomorrow? Tomorrow, yes. yeah. That's like the next big hurdle here for me. Future's up 14 and all is... Try to get uh, some of all the chaos for you. We can do that with Julie Norman. She's co-director of UCL Center on U.S. Politics. And there's a laundry list of things to talk about. I think we'll get to the debt ceiling. But Professor Norman, I just want to talk about how all of a sudden the idiosyncratic is not idiosyncratic. And that we're going to rationalize this morning as idiosyncratic Monday. And maybe it's Argentina Total chaos, won't go into the details. Thailand, an election. Turkey, an election. As you study this, when does the idiosyncratic, how does it not become idiosyncratic? Are we there? <laughs> Well, Tom, I think this is kind of more common than we think. I mean, all, all the time we're having uh, changes happening around the world in ways that I think end up having later ripple effects, and some we just pay more attention to than, than others. I think this week, uh, many in the U.S. and really in the U.K. and across NATO are watching Turkey's elections very quickly, or very closely. Those will likely be going to uh, runoffs later on this month, Turkey, of course, being a key uh, member in NATO, and a shift from Erdogan's power really uh, could change how that, um, how that relationship Relationship looks in terms of uh, Turkey's relationship with with Russia, with Ukraine, and also with expanding NATO. So I think that's where right. a lot of eyes are on right now. So, are we no different in that it's a measurement between autocracy and democracy? And is that where we're heading in this election? Is a study of autocracy and democracy in the United States of America? It's over there. It's distant. It's removed until it's not. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, I think Biden obviously has used that language a lot of kind of using this de democracy first autocracy kind of dichotomy. But in fact, in many countries and many regions, we have we've seen this uh, playing out for quite a while. It's often a mix of both. You mentioned Thailand before. Uh, that's a place where we've seen different waves of protests and uprisings to push for democracy. We saw that uh, pro-democracy vote this week. So I would say this this kind of thing is constantly in flux. And uh, I think Turkey is a kind of a prime example of a place where we've seen authoritarianism uh, creep further in against, against what was a, a democratic uh, and still is a democratic country. But even within that, how you can see authoritarian tendencies, um, you know, take shape and take control. How does this color the debate, Julie, heading into the G7 meetings, which happen, I believe, next weekend? Yeah, so I mean, the G7 will be in Japan this uh, this year, which is notable, I think, as the U.S. and most eyes are looking towards the Pacific, looking towards China. So I think we may hear a bit more pointed language around China in particular, some uh, more pointed language, at least the U.S. is pushing for, around um, China's eco economic coercion and trying to get a little more sense of synergy across the G7 members of what that might look like. Usually these joint statements are very light touch, but I would say the summits are important for keeping allies on the same page, especially at this moment when China, Russia are continuing to be obviously big questions and the synergy of the G7 
and other uh, close partners are really going to be key in, in how everyone moves forward on these. There's some discussion, Julie, about President Biden not going to G7 if we cannot get some sort of progress on the debt ceiling, on the debt debate, uh, which is going on in Washington, D.C. How likely is that and what is the potential implication of that? Yeah, so it's possible that, that Biden wouldn't or would maybe uh, go virtually. I, I, my understanding is that right now he is still planning to go. Um, you know, usually Biden uh, does well in these uh, multilateral settings, especially in trying to, again, get this sense of cooperation across allies. So I think this is kind of a, a point that he likes to, to usually be, be present on the front lines for. With that said, everyone's very you know, clear on the reality of what's going on in Washington. Um, my sense is that, you know, there will be meetings earlier this week. I don't think anyone's expecting a massive breakthrough tomorrow. And so um, there could be just business that's closed on that after the G7, of, of course, if, if we're lucky and if negotiations keep going the right way. We talk about how there's complacency in stock markets. That's what we were just talking about with Sebastian Page of Tiro Price. And other people are saying the same, that no one's going to blink here in the markets because we've seen this story before. Does it feel different to you that this is somehow a more perilous debate and more prone to having an accident? Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a tough one because, as you said, we kind of have this, well, they're going to figure it out. They always have in the past kind of sense. And I think, you know, as your other guests have, have said uh, more eloquently, that's, you know, that's keeping markets somewhat calmer than maybe we would uh, expect in some ways. But at the same time, I think our politics is very different now than it was even, you know, in 2011, the last time we really saw this kind of face off in that even if you have a strong negotiation and breakthroughs between Biden, McCarthy and the congressional leaders, can they actually get their caucuses to go along with it? And can we actually get something passed? And, and I think that um, leverage and leadership looks a little bit different than it did 10 years ago, just because of the polarization that we see today. So it is different in that regard. I don't think that means it's not going to work, but um, there's just still a lot of unknowns and how this is going to play out differently than it did in the past. Judy, wonderful to get your perspective on an important topic. Judy Norman there of the UCL Center on US politics. Things are different this time to a certain extent. <clears throat> But Tom, the outcome, the outcome at the moment that most people forecast remains the same. Yeah, I, I think on the set of issues we have, that's entirely true. And that's why we get into this odd, odd Monday that we're in with the, with the churning. And again, I go, John, to the convergence in the equity market, which is just the absolute collar, the absolute range bound, because we don't know which way we're going to cut, waiting for things to turn out like we perceive they're going to turn out, says who? Well, let's talk about the differences. I think what Julie was alluding to there was Speaker McCarthy and the difficulty he might have getting any agreement through the House, Bramo. He did something that I think was still something, which was a number of weeks ago, get an agreement through the House. But whatever they agree between themselves, the president, him and other leaders in Congress, that might be more difficult. There are two conversations going on in any room. What practically uh, could be done in terms of getting some sort of agreement and then how they can then go and come up with political wins to their constituents to basically show that they didn't get taken advantage of. And that's what you're going to be seeing on both sides. Basically, you're going to have the actual document of how we progress with good fiscal policy. That's sort of the lesser discussion. And then the greater discussion is, how do I not get egg on my face? And that's sort of what we're feeling. And uh, Kevin McCarthy more than anyone, because he's trying to keep that unity within the House. Who wins out of this? Nobody. Who wins out of this, Tom? I, I hope that we win out of it some form of commission. It will never be apolitical, but the way we win is a commission out of it that is mandated from the beginning to get something done. I think I'm dreaming, but that would be the win. To me, the win would be if people started to realize that they want it to be more functional and they want fewer talking points and more to actually dig into the details and understand what fiscal responsibility means and what you want to fund and what you don't want to fund, how to create more streamlined programs, create efficiency, sort of a more technocratic approach. I think that would be really great. <laughs> both of you sound so hopeful. <laughs> I think you're both dreaming. But that was nice. That Wasn't was it? nice. Yeah, that, yeah, that was meaningful. That was place. nice. That was really Meaningful? special. Really? That was really special. Yeah. Lindsay Piex or Estifo joining us shortly <laughs> on the S&P 500, positive 0.4%. Retail sales tomorrow. We get some earnings from retailers through the week. Then on to Chairman Powell later this week as well. So tons of Fed speak in the mix too. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Welcome to the program. Getting your week started with equity futures just about positive on the S&P 500. Some soothing words over the weekend around the debt ceiling. Talks are constructive. We're moving forward. We'll have talks tomorrow with Speaker McCarthy and the President of the United States before the President jets off to Japan. Look out for that. Your equity market positive 0.4% on the S&P on the Nasdaq. Positive 0.25% into the bond market two-year. 10-year, 30-year, looks like this on a two-year, yields just a bit higher across the curve by about a basis point, just short of 4% on a two-year, 399.78. I just want to finish on Europe and the euro. Euro dollar, 108 handle. There we go. 108.73, positive 0.2%. Mislav Mateka of JP Morgan and the team making some headlines over the last week, reaffirming, reaffirming their stance this morning and saying this, the activity upswing seen around the turn of the year, which was helped by the falling gas prices in Europe, and China reopening, unlikely to transition into an acceleration in the second half. TK, they say this, we believe the time has come to now close the trade of overweight Eurozone versus the United States. That's a guesstimate on it. You know, everybody's got a different opinion out there. What I would suggest is I go back to nominal GDP, and I just don't see a nominal GDP. If you get some form of disinflation, whatever it is, a little bit, teensy weens, maybe a substantial amount of disinflation, nominal GDP comes down, and, and that makes everything just harder to do. And is Europe able to do that, frankly, with a war going on as well, than the United States. I wouldn't be so optimistic. Lisa, there's a bank fade in that long Europe story. The interesting thing is the actual data is coming in anecdotally, and you've pointed this out, potentially with a bearish kind of tilt to what's going on going forward in Europe. And yet the European uh, Commission came out overnight and they were talking about how inflation is probably going to remain sticky, but also there's no recession in sight anywhere in the euro region and everything is great. So at what point do you end up seeing the tea leaves like the senior loan officer survey, the sleuths of Europe, basically coming out with some negativity? <laughs> I thought we already had the sleuths of Europe, and they were pretty ugly. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm, bank I'm referencing data. that. And I don't know about you, but if I was putting a trade on, I always wait for the European Commission to come out with their forecast. And then you short it. Absolutely, and then go <laughs> the other way. <laughs> yes. Bloomberg sitting down with a range of people this week, not on the ECB, but on the Fed. Raphael Bostic, Thomas Barkin, Austin Goolsby. Great conversations coming up later on through the week. Steve Falls, Lindsay Piegs are wanking on the Fed's path forward, saying this, Tom. The committee has indicated a willingness to move to the sidelines in June and still may do so. However, the latest price data does not make the case for the Fed. Rather, any decision to pause would be made in spite of the latest still elevated inflation data. Still elevated. came in a little bit and the vectors are in the right direction. But yes, still elevated is absolutely at where we are. Lindsay Piegza joins us now, chief economist at Stiefel. Lindsay, just simple. I'm exhausted by it on a boring Monday in May where we're trying to sort out eight, nine, ten different threads. How close are we to recession? I think the Fed has done a very good job of continuing to support the economy while raising rates and trying to tame inflation. And so this delicate balance has allowed, I think, the consumer to continue to stay afloat, which pushes out our recession call to the end of the year. Now, we do expect a downturn. But that being said, with the resilience of the consumer, Q2 GDP could actually surprise to the upside, leading the first half of the year well above earlier expectations, much more robust than expected, offsetting even if we do see some of that downturn then in the second uh, second half of the year. So if we get a 2.x percent economy, fine. How much of it is it, how much of America's advantaged by that? And how much of America is really struggling right now? Because I got all sorts of studies from Bloomberg and others that say there's a lot of people out there struggling, including bankruptcy levels. How narrow is this prosperity? I think it is pretty narrow because when we isolate the consumer and look at how the consumer is spending, much of the factors that are supporting this still positive, albeit significantly reduced level of expenditures, are very temporary factors. It's because consumers are increasingly willing to draw down savings because they're still relying on that last sputtering of state and local stimulus because they're increasingly turning to credit card debt to supplement their spending. So it's very clear that the consumer is on fragile footing, but they're proving resilient, at least temporarily. And because of that resilience, businesses that were arguably overly optimistic in the first quarter are going to have to reverse course and increase production in Q2, significantly contributing to top line growth. Or if they don't, and we see a growing disconnect between demand and supply, that will slow the level of disinflation that we've seen in this economy thus far. In either case, this puts pressure on the Fed 
to continue raising rates. Why is it bad, Lindsay, to see a slower disinflation and strong growth if that disinflation gets us back to that 2 percent level? Well, it's not, but it's predicated on the second part of your argument, if it gets us back to that 2 percent level. The problem is the level of momentum, that disinflation momentum, is very, very minimal well under what the Fed had anticipated at this point in the cycle. And if, in fact, the Fed stops or, or moves to the sideline and allows inflation expectations to pick up, as we saw in the latest UMICH survey, that could reverse some of this improvement. And so the, the pace of disinflation is not necessarily quite as important as the market buying into the Fed's resolve to continue along the pathway so, though, so that that level of disinflation leads us back to 2 percent target. Lindsay, I was really struck by a lot of the retailers' reports, not the ones that we're going to get this week, obviously, but the ones that have already reported, and how much of the uh, price increase they're passing along to consumers. They're actually increasing their profits, the profit margins, for the first time in about a year and a half, if you take a look at what's reported so far in the S&P 500. Does this seem sustainable to you, that basically consumers are not pushing back and that pricing power is so extreme for some of these companies that they can keep just jacking prices up uh, even well beyond what their production costs are. Well, it's interesting because when we look at the producer price increases, we see that costs, yes, of materials inputs are still going up. But to your point, businesses are passing on that and more to consumers. Now, again, consumers are proving resilient. They are able to tap into some stored wealth, allowing businesses to pass on <laughs> that cost increase. And if you look at the surveys, consumers are increasingly uh, willing and accepting of that level of inflation. But Going forward, it's all going to come down to that stockpile of wealth and the ability for the consumer to make purchases in the marketplace. So At some point, those savings, that wealth runs out, and businesses won't be able to pass on that cost increase without a significant loss of market share. So translate that into retail sales tomorrow. Take it right down to the acuity of what we're going to see tomorrow in retail sales. Well, when we look at this on a monthly basis, what we've seen is that consumer spending is increasingly volatile. Consumers are dramatically shifting the goods and services in their basket, something that they do when they're increasingly concerned about their financial footing. And so we do expect that volatility to ma be maintained going forward, albeit for this week's report, we do expect mm -hmm. an uptick, a positive monthly increase. But again, looking at this on a year-over-year -year basis, <clears throat> excuse me, we have seen a significant loss of momentum from double-digit growth in the aftermath of the pandemic, now down to a very minimal but welcomed 2 percent level. So finally, Lindsay, what's your run rate on real GDP and nominal GDP sort of through the summer and into autumn? Are you, are you running a 2 percent statistic, or maybe a 5 percent nominal GDP? I think Q2, we absolutely could get a two-handle. Again, if we see a rebuilding of those inventories, businesses stepping back up their production in response to the resilient consumer, it's very realistic to see a two-handle in Q2. However, as we move into the second half of the year, that's where the Fed tightening really chokes off uh, top-line GDP, and we could see a sub-1% and perhaps the first negative print by the end of the year. Lindsay, thank you for the glide path Thank through you. the rest of this year. Lindsay PX of there of Stiefel. I feel like we've been saying that for 12 months. Oh, I'd go at 18. At least a year. At, le at least a year. I'd go 18%. And, and uh, you know, to be fair, it's easy to second-guess people, but it's not that it's a wrong call. It's just getting the x-axis right. And it's brutal. It's I not mean, always the case. It, it's, it's Well, yeah, but, you know, it's getting going. It's going to be here. a recession it, at some it, point. It's, it's out there somewhere. <laughs> and I give Deutsche Bank immense credit for this. Deutsche Bank came right out of the blocks and said there's a recession, but it's out there somewhere where others were gaming in the short term. Mike Gay from the Bank of America. So far, <clears throat> the Bank of America card data, they get this card data at B of A, yeah. point to a relatively benign consumption slowdown, a few signs of bank stress weighing on spending. Have we got this window then? Basically this window where the economy remains resilient still and then out there somewhere is a slowdown. I won't name names, it's unfair. We all make bad calls. Totally get it. But I do remember people who were sitting here saying that by the end of September, not this September, last September, <laughs> the slowdown would be so obvious the Fed would have to pause. <laughs> here we are. The problem is we don't really understand what's driving this inflation, right? We do understand some of the contours of it, but people mis uh, underestimated just how much the stimulus was still sloshing around the system, how much consumers could keep spending. And, oh, yeah, by the way, they cleared out their credit deck, so now they can borrow more and they can keep spending. So how do you factor in when does that impulse stop? Uh, when I, do they stop spending and stop saying YOLO? I mean, that's really essentially what happened. Complete aside, but I do the technology overlay <laughs> on <laughs> credit. <laughs>
I do the technology overlay on credit. Do we really know what credit card dynamics is? I adore the Bank of America data. I think it's very valid, the MasterCard data with Michelle Meyer and others. But but do we understand how people are borrowing now because of all these fintech-y kind of things that are out there? We've all got this faith in this slowdown at some point on it's the horizon. Out there. And it's not just the economists that have got that faith now. The policymakers too, the Federal Reserve, share the same faith. This came from Governor Jefferson going into the weekend and presumed form future vice chair as well of the Federal Reserve. Disinflation in core goods prices is occurring at a slower pace than expected. But here we go. The full effects of our rapid tightening are still likely ahead of us. So they're starting to get comfortable with this idea that it's also, Lisa, on the horizon. If you look at some of the granular data, it does show that there is a slowing. It's just happening really, really slowly. And the big question is, if it happens really slowly and companies uh, are able to jack prices up, then all of a sudden, are we getting people who are used to inflation? And that was the concern with the University of Michigan sentiment survey that came out on Friday. Are people sort of readjusting to this being the new normal? And that's a huge problem for the Federal Reserve. And that's the risk that perhaps is unspoken as often as it should at a time when the uh, economy I, just isn't cracking. It's, it's a point, John, of 12 months, 18 months. Uh, on radio right now, folks, I'm looking at the TV screen, 4154. Did anyone <laughs> think we'd be at 4154? Round it up, John, that's 4200. Uh, TK, you've it's, been great at this. A high, okay. a high nominal GDP world. Yes. That's well, what we've been fighting this is against. Phil Carre, one of my heroes, the gentleman who founded Pioneer Company, uh, knew my father, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is Phil Carre said, Nominal GDP and the inflation overlay it brings are bright lights, which makes everybody look good, everybody feel good. And that's what you have is a feel good five, six, seven percent nominal GDP. Is that coming down? But what's it coming down to? Does this feel good? This feels good. I think for a huge part of America, this is a golden time. There's another part if you're that's flat on, radio, on their backs. If you're listening on radio, based on Bramo's face. Yeah. I don't think Bramo thinks this feels good. Well, I just think that it's it's a challenge. And if you take a look at the sentiment, it actually cratered because of some of the concerns. I'm just saying it. I don't know. Does this Final word. You know when you're no longer at the Fed and you say what you think? It's the same true of United Airlines. When Oscar Munoz joins us in about an hour from now, the former United Airlines CEO, will he be can open he get, about the airline industry <clears throat> in a way that he can, wasn't can, when he was the CEO? Can he get a United Club? fantastic dovetail. That was, that was you see how long the lines are for the lounges at the airport? That, <laughs> that is coming ridiculous. In, like, outside the United Club. Everyone's, I know Scott. I know Scott. <laughs> let me in. Let me in. Everyone's got access now. <laughs> well, if you have an American Express card. Yeah, you just need a card. Yeah, exactly. You just need a credit card. You spend a lot of money on it and you're in. Yeah. You're in. Never mind flying. Well, <laughs> you can't get in if you fly. You People just go to the airport to go to the club. <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The political fate of Turkey's president hangs in the balance as he looks ahead for a runoff election in two weeks. Preliminary results show Recep Tayyip Erdogan with a lead of more than two million votes, which is not enough to avoid a second round. Now, that would pit him against opposition leader Kemal Kilik Derulu. Erdogan has been in power for two decades. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky meets with UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today. The British government says it will be providing Ukraine with hundreds of air defense missiles and hundreds of new long-range attack drones. Over the weekend, Zelensky met separately with leaders of Germany and France. The European Commission has significantly raised its inflation outlook for Eurozone inflation. Now, it's forecasting consumer price growth at 5.8 percent this year and 2.8 percent in 2024. At the same time, economic growth forecasts also were increased. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. There are clearly some signs that the inflationary dynamic is beginning to change from an overall level it's moderating downwards from where we were a year ago but inside that inflation we're still seeing core inflation at too high a level uh, and i do believe that across 2023 and 2024 the ecb and governments can take the steps that are needed to get inflation back down to a level 
that it will not be the challenge that it is today. That was the Eurogroup president, Pascal Donahoe, speaking to Maria Tadeo in Brussels earlier. We'll catch up with Maria in just a moment. Just in terms of the glide path for the rest of this week, you're going to look at retail sales tomorrow, then on to Target and Walmart earnings later on in the week as well. Looking at equity futures right now, no real drama here whatsoever. Positive 0.4% on the S&P 500. Hearing all the right things over the weekend from the National Economic Council Director, Leo Brainerd. The staff are engaged. I'd characterise the engagement as serious, constructive, referring to the staff level talks around the debt ceiling. We'll get to the bigger, higher level talks tomorrow between Speaker McCarthy and President Biden. Tom, those talks resume in about 24 hours. Yeah, they, okay, they resume in 24 hours, and it's staff level, right? Are they going to be fancy people sitting on a fancy couch in the Oval Office? I'm not sure. Tomorrow? Yeah, yeah tomorrow. I think that the That's the precisically what we get tomorrow. Is it yeah, yeah, tomorrow show up? And what, what's been going okay. on is that the staff has been not sleeping okay. and not going on vacation. And just to be clear, they are not leaving Washington, D.C. They'll be working around the clock. Yeah, they bike and riding over the weekend. They were, they were all missing family meetings and family mm. events and missing Mother's Day as they worked through the clock, which is exactly what's happening until you have this sort of like grand meeting, fancy people in the Oval Office. I mean, we'll have to, we'll have to see. I mean, we're all I, excited, Tom. I... I I, How can you say that with a straight no, face? No, I'm not. I, not? I, I, I am no. in the camp. It's just, it's going to happen. They're going to work it out. They're going to do it like they do in Brussels. That's what they're going to do. Joining us now from Brussels, <laughs> Maria Tadeo here on a really odd Monday. I'm sure, Maria, it is the same for you as us. There's eight, nine, ten stories. How confused is Brussels right now, and particularly with the overlay of a horrific battle in Ukraine? Uh, yes, Tom, and there's two big stories today. Funnily enough, we talk about the inflation uh, problem. Obviously, we also had new projections from the euro area, higher inflation for longer now expected. But really, when you talk to officials today, they tell you they're focused on Turkey and they're focused on Ukraine. And remember, over the weekend, you had President Zelensky on a major diplomatic push. He was in Italy. He was in Germany. Yesterday, uh, he was in France. And today, he is in the UK. A lot of the focus right. here has to do with the counteroffensive, uh, Tom, there's a lot of expectation, hope for the Ukrainians. But also remember, preparation for the NATO meeting in July, that is going to be incredibly important. Uh, Maria, what is the significance? And I'm going to suggest it was buried over the weekend in the news. But nevertheless, Germany acted on funding Ukraine. Brief us on the importance of that event. Uh, Tom, that's an excellent point, and, and I'm happy that you brought it uh, well forward and up on the show because this was the biggest package that Germany has provided for Ukraine to date. It is 2.7 billion uh, euros for fresh weapons for Ukraine. There are many ways that you can look at this. First of all, the language coming out of Olive Schultz, completely different. This is a member of the SPD. Remember, a lot of the blame for that very tight relationship between Germany and Russia has fallen on the Social Democrats in Germany. That was a point of almost before and after moment where Olaf Scholz came out in Ukrainian and said, well, Slava Ukraini, the Ukrainians have to win this war and we have the money uh, to help you. That's on the political front. You have the tactical too. There's more weapons coming into this country, but also the symbolic nature of it. It does show and it would show that Germany is now willing to spend big with the shift in policy when it comes not just a relationship with Ukraine, but also Russia. And the words of President Zelensky too, he said Germany is a good friend of Ukraine. We can rely on Germany, and it's going to be now the second biggest contributor to Ukraine. And I believe that Vladimir Zelensky is actually headed over to London uh, next, the UK being the next potential donor to the effort. There has been a shift over the past few days. We've seen uh, reports about Ukraine shooting down a fighter jet that belonged to Russia. We've talked about trying to, uh, we've heard about them reclaiming certain territories that had been occupied by Russia. The people who you speak to, does it feel like there is a tipping point going on in what otherwise has been just sheer drudgery and, and a tragedy, frankly. Uh, look, the people that I speak to, what they say is at this point you have to be very careful because the Ukrainians will say one thing, but obviously the Russians will then point uh, to another piece of information. What they take away from it is that the situation on the ground must be heated. Again, when you look at this counteroffensive, everyone is watching for this. Uh, a lot of the ideas to whether or not Ukraine can be successful will depend on this counteroffensive. And on that note, I will really point to this interview on Saturday on Italian TV of all places, uh, on Rai, that is the state TV in Italy, where President Zelensky 
Zelensky repeated, this is not the time to talk with Vladimir Putin. There is nothing to talk with the Russian president. The focus on Ukraine is a counteroffensive. And to get to peace, we need to have a successful counteroffensive. Turkey has been a key broker in a range of things over the last 12 months, Maria, as you know. In Brussels at the moment, can you tell us how they're responding to the election that took place over the weekend, the potential runoff that we're set to see in the next couple of weeks? Ooh, th th this one is one that they watch very closely because uh, remember this is at times a partner to the EU but we know there has been uh, tensions particularly with some members of the EU you know there's uh, tensions that flare up between the Greeks and the Turks at times so this is a, a crucial relationship on many fronts uh, you talk about the war you talk about the grain deal that Erdogan was able to broker but we know at times there are tensions when it comes to Turkey's role in NATO remember uh, the weapons that they bought from the Russians this idea that they try to play it uh, to waste but they were instrumental Instrumental when it comes to the grain deal and they are whether the Europeans like it or not instrumental when it comes uh, to migration when you listen to von der Leyen she just gave a press conference about 20 minutes ago she said this is a crucial election we closely keep an eye on it and everything is still open according to the head of the European Commission Maria wonderful to get your perspective thank you thank you very much Erdogan Tom toughest test in two decades according to so many people that know this area of the world better than we do. And what's important here is the length of duration. Can you imagine a U.S. president or an English prime minister moving out for 11 years, 20 years? Uh, the length, the duration is exhausting. 20 years. I don't care who it is. It's 20 years. And I have spent a fair amount of time in Istanbul and early Erdogan, and this is not the same well, that was different. as early Erdogan. It's way, I don't, I don't think the West, a lot of people, listeners, viewers understand it's completely different Turkey now than it was in 2005, say. The implications for NATO and the implications for the broader region are quite significant because all of a sudden if you have a new leader in Turkey who is much less authoritarian and more uh, willing to sort of bring Turkey into the fold of the European Union, perhaps opening up uh, the idea of NATO to Ukraine, having a more cohesive relationship with some of the allies – to me, would be a, a game changer. A lot of people are looking at that as a potential key uh, key point, especially given that people are revolting, given the fact yeah. that the economy hasn't been doing so well. From Only a market standpoint, just finally, Tom, I think the one thing we're all waiting for is whether you get the return of monetary policy orthodoxy, because let's just say things have been unorthodox over in Turkey for a while on that front. Tom, I know you're focused on this one headline that we got from Argentina over the weekend. You want to talk about monetary policy orthodoxy. I they're set to raise the key interest rate by 600 basis points to 97% today. That's pretty I, phenomenal I, I, stuff. I can give you the exact number, John. I'm going to look at the Bloomberg terminal, and I've got uh, 4,900 charts on the Bloomberg terminal. The most emotional chart is Argentina, and it's real simple here. Argentina peso at a 229. Black market reaches out approaching 500 pesos. And if you look at that with some fancy mathematics, it's beyond ugly. It's sustained ugly. And over the weekend, maybe they're finally going to confront this. Inflation, 109 percent, just to give you some perspective of what would uh, sort of prompt this dramatic move. Is this a sign that monetary policy doesn't work at a certain point? Can we just say that? You can't really fight 109 percent inflation by jacking uh, up the interest rate rate by 600 basis points because guess what people aren't even using the currency anymore they're just simply leaving uh, with respect to the the monetary structure and using dollars it, to your it, point the black market it, the blur well the black market down there's profound the so-called blue dollar but and thank you patrick gillespie and buenos aires for your ho help here with bloomberg uh, news at the imf meetings in the blur one bar chart which showed here much here's how much Cristalina gorgieva has given argentina and here's how much she's given everybody else and it's stunning how much has been given to Argentina to help them with this mess? We usually laugh off the I word, but I think what happens in Argentina is often deeply idiosyncratic. Tom, I deeply agree. I agree. And in culturally like as well, going back to Just keep doing uh, the middle this of the 20th century. I have been told, I'm an amateur at this big time, and I've been told by others, yes, John, it is cultural. Well, and there's this question of, well, at what point do you get fiscal discipline if nobody believes you and will lend you anyway? I mean, that's really the issue, right? Because Wasn't if... there a century bond not too long ago in Argentina? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> what, that was... <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it was the era where no one could default and it was free money forever. Amazing. I don't know if it was that, you know, I just think it was, I'll hold it now, but ultimately I'll get rid of it to someone else at a better price. There's a theory that longer term is better because they're going to pay eventually because someone will help them, but the short term is actually more difficult because <laughs> they're probably not going to get paid them back in the short term.
I think the rate hikes from last November haven't even really hit the economy. What's going to have to happen for them to actually cut rates is going to be to start to see cracks in the labor market. For me, the labor market's really key, and the rebalancing that we're seeing mm -hmm. there, I think it's very encouraging. We know the risk of recession is high, but we're not seeing the whites of the eyes of it in hard data. We're not going back to a world that we struggle to get 2% inflation. You know, if we get to 3%, we're lucky. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow, <coughs> your equity market positive 0.4%. This week, retail sales tomorrow, earnings from Target and Walmart. On to Friday, Tom, we hear from Chairman Powell and Ben Bernanke, actually, a little bit later this week. We're going to talk about Paul Bernanke. That's actually an important conversation, and there's a whole economic history to it. What I would suggest, John, is the last hour was the clumsiest hour we've had in about <laughs> eight months. <laughs> and we're going to straighten it out right now on radio and in television. Have. We have a guest coming up to talk about how narrow the markets are, and that's his oddity of this May 2023. Stuart Kaiser of City going over the performance of the last three months, Lisa. The S&P 500 over the last three months up 1%. The Nasdaq up 8%. The Russell down 11 And if you want to go deeper than that, the regionals last week, the regional banks got hammered. The regional banks were down by more than 6%, and the S&P 500 held up pretty well with that as the backdrop. Stuart, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk with him because he put out this one aspect where it's basically saying on a volatility versus the range uh, kind of basis, it has been one of the most painful periods of time for traders going back to 1980. And to me, this really highlights the angst that we keep feeling yeah. as everyone talks about the pain of a range that doesn't seem to make Talk about sense. the pain of the range. AC Milan plays tomorrow in Inter <laughs> Milan. And uh, Mr. You know, do you watch or what do you do? Well, I just want to say, you know, Are we've you been medicated? so nice to our next guest because he brought us in gifts. <laughs> on radio, no, no Pirlo, it's no party. Who's no. Pirlo? And, oh my goodness, who's Pirlo? You're going to be wearing the T-shirt. You know that, right? And, this who's, doesn't, who's, it, who's Pirlo? It doesn't Andrea, fit. Andrea Pirlo. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Young man comes out of Brescia in a youth team. The whole of Italy knows who he is. He's the future of Italian football. Goes to Inter Milan from Brescia. Doesn't do so well. Goes on loan a couple of times. Then AC Milan get hold of this player. And Carlo Ancelotti repositions him as a deep-lying playmaker just in front of the back four. Changes the game. Mm -hmm. They play in this beautiful diamond and dominate European football for much of the next decade. <laughs> Goes on to win the World Cup with Italy. Writes in his biography, Tom, great book, you should read it, that he doesn't feel stress at all. He woke up in the morning, he played the PlayStation, went out in the afternoon and won the World Cup. That's what Bremo does. There we go. And Reb, who's Pirlo? Who's Pirlo? Pirlo's a god, Tom, of Italian football. <laughs> Global football. Thanks. This, is, is. Is, this is going down in flames. Stuart Kaiser, welcome to the show. We'll get to you in a moment, Stuart. I've got to get to the price section. Yeah, please. <laughs> you thought the last hour was bad. Wait for this hour. On the S&P 500, up by 0.4%. Yields look like this in the bond market. Lisa, keep it together. Yields up a couple of basis points Save in 10 us, years. Lisa. 348 right. And here's where the energy comes to die. 8.30 a.m. U.S. Empire, Empire Manufacturing Survey. There is some data coming out, and this is ahead of the retail sales that we get tomorrow and then throughout the rest of the week and the specific names that are going to be reporting. I'm very curious to see whether we see any kind of rolling over as some of the surprises haven't been as positive over the past few days. 11 a.m., we get the New York Fed releasing <laughs> the first first quarter 2023 uh, household debt and credit report. The key here is credit card receivables. How much are credit card outstandings increasing as people uh, fuel their expenditures with debt? This is something that they have a lot of room to do because they cleared the balance sheets, but how much uh, can they keep doing it? At 2 p.m., we hear from Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic. He is going to be speaking with our own Michael McKee down in Amelia Island, where they're having their conference, which is going to talk all about kind of the road ahead and parse through a lot of academic papers. Very cool. Looking forward to it. Stuart Kaiser City, an official welcome to the program. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Thank thanks you. For being well, thanks. Thank you for the merch. We appreciate <laughs> it. Let's just start with your note that came out yesterday evening and just begin with the performance you went through. Equal weight S&P, the Nasdaq, the headline S&P 500, the Russell. What do all those different performance figures over the last three months tell you? What's the over overarching story? I think, I think it tells you people are just pretty conservatively positioned, frankly. It's, it's large cap tech leadership, high quality stocks, low risk stocks that are really driving the market higher. And that just tells you 
you know, that people, if they're going to be in equity markets, um, need to have a reason to be. Right. So you need a story or a theme or a high quality stock that gets you out of a 5% cash yield um, into an equity market that's been highly volatile. I looked on a log SPX and I noticed three moving averages I use have converged to two tenths of a percent, 0.0024% of the S&P 500. You call it home on the painful range. What's the history to identify which way you go to get out of a painful range? I, I, think, I think it's a great question, Tom, especially right now, because it does feel like we're sort of bracketed in, you know, where we are right now. When you when you get up to that sort of 4,200 range, you kind of run into a valuation friction where people aren't, you know, comfortable on the equities at that level, particularly when they're clipping a 5% coupon in cash. And to the downside, you know, we're, we're conservatively positioned, as I mentioned. Mutual funds are very low beta. And expectations are so low right now that it's kind of hard to surprise people, you know, to, to, to the downside. So, you know, in terms of breaking out of this range, I think, you know, to the upside, it, it's going to have to be positioning driven. You know, maybe people get the follow the Fed mentality and you get a bit of a positioning, you know, squeeze to the upside. And, and to the downside, frankly, I think it's U.S. growth and it's the debt ceiling. You know, the debt ceiling is more tactical. And, and the U.S. growth data, I think, would really need to fall apart in, in pretty aggressive fashion, but I think that's what can break you out to the downside right now. Before we get into some of those scenarios and the analysis that comes with it, I want to just sit on this range. And you talk about how, if you look at one measure, it's the most painful range going back to 1980 or one of them. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what the incentive is for anyone to do anything other than just sit in cash and get 5% if you're not going to get rewarded and the likelihood of getting you know, your face ripped off is pretty high? Uh, look, I think that's that, that's one of the big challenges, right? I mean, if you look at it, we did a quick survey of our investors, and two-thirds of people said they wouldn't put money into equity markets unless they had 10%, 10 or more potential upside, <laughs> right? So to get people in the market, you really need to offer them something. And so I think, you know, that's why we run into this valuation limit around 4,200, because you add 10% to 4,200, all of a sudden you're at 4,600, and a lot of people aren't kind of comfortable with, you know, with that type of upside level. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of bouncing into – a ceiling at a floor, effectively. And to Tom's point, it's really narrowed all of these technicals, which you could argue creates kind of a, you know, a very uncomfortable moment for markets. If there is more stability in the bond market, which we've seen, will that give the catalyst sort of the ability for stocks to find some sort of direction that has a little bit more <clears throat> conviction behind it? I, definitely, Lisa. I think that's actually been a big contributor this year. If you look at, you know, bond volatility and also the volatility of economic data itself, that stuff has really started to narrow. I think it's made the market more investable. Um, as I mentioned, it's hard to surprise people people. I mean, after what happened last year, it's kind of hard to come out with something really surprising. So, yeah, I think bond volatility coming in, a, a clearer path, you know, to Fed funds and inflation gives people more confidence to be in markets. But I think that's what got us from 3,800 to 4,200. You know, what gets right. us that next step, I think, is the bigger question. John, John Stolfus just publishes at Opco, the same as Stuart Kaiser, the same as Goldman Sachs. The idea, once again, earnings have surprised people. Everybody had a gloom framework. Guess what? It didn't happen. Stuart, you mentioned the tactical call around the debt ceiling and then talked about the longer time horizon. Does one inform the other? Does the debt ceiling negotiations ultimately mean slower growth in our future? Uh, you know, I think uh, only if it really disrupts uh, financial markets from here, I think. You know, I think, you know, if, if this was something persistent that kind of impacted government spending and activity, then, yeah, I think that would increase your, your recession risks. If this is more of a one to two week, just kind of choppy market scenario, I don't think it'll have a, a huge impact uh, on the growth outlook. I think the, the big wild card in the growth outlook is the credit channel. You know, did, did we really disrupt lending or not? And I think that's why people are a little bit sort of on edge, uh, particularly because the Fed doesn't control the lending mm -hmm. channel, right? So if if that, if that tightens meaningfully, it's sort of outside of the Fed's control, and you could actually get an over-tightening that the Fed didn't really want initially. Can our radio and TV listeners, should they and how should they own shares of Apple Computer? How, <laughs> how do you comfortably own something that elevated, that dominant? I, I think that I think Apple and you know call it the big sort of five to ten stocks in the market are giving people a lot of angst just just for that reason. I mean, if if you're in Apple right now, I think it's a because you love the products and b because they probably have negative net debt on balance sheet and and relatively strong earnings growth. So I think if you're in those stocks, it's because it's something you're comfortable owning. Mm -hmm. now, if you look at year to date, we've seen basically inflow into three sectors. Um, healthcare, industrials, and tech. And I think you would argue both industrials and tech have really strong kind of investment thematics behind them that people were like comfortable owning it, right. you know, d despite recessionary risk. So yeah, I think if you're in Apple, it's because you believe in kind of the medium to long-term trend of the stock. And in the near term, you're comfortable based on, you know, kind of the size and quality. And how do you adapt to the zeitgeist, which shows everybody's scared stiff? Any number of different, John, you know the metrics better than me, but the answer is everybody's scared stiff. How do you adapt to that? 
Well, I think I think the scared stiff is why you know cash positions are high. It's why mutual fund betas are low. So I think to me, what that's actually done is it's it's raised the floor to the market a little bit because there's there's not much left to sell. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is the big question: is how do you tempt people out of to your point, high yield bond market, you know, higher yielding you know cash markets into equity markets? And I think the answer there is you need to have a single stock story, you need to have like a macro thematic like the Inflation Reduction Act creating a huge amount of spending, or you need the Fed to stop and to get this kind of FOMO follow the Fed rally. Um, that's not our base case, nor something we necessarily endorse, but um, it, it's certainly something that I think people are teeing themselves up for. Your point on the credit channel is so important. We either find out the Fed's over tightened or under tightened based on yeah. what develops there, don't we? Is it that simple? I, I think so. I mean, what we've said, everybody's saying, oh, this is great news. The market's going to do some of the tightening for the Fed. Um, I, we actually kind of disagree with that. I think if you thought the Fed needed to do 10 units of tightening, and now they're going to do eight and outsource two to the market. Well, they don't control that two, right? That two could be zero, it could be six. So from our perspective, it actually adds more uncertainty to the growth outlook that you're, quote unquote, allowing the market or getting help from the market to do the tightening. So I actually think what that's done is it's, it's helped the rate aspect of it, but it's actually added more uncertainty to the growth aspect, in my opinion. Um, Seth Carpenter we'll and Morgan Stanley said a similar thing. He said the calibration of all of this gets so much harder when you outsource it to the credit channel in the way that it has been done because of the banking stress of the last couple of months. Stuart, this was fun. This was great. Thank Let's you. do it again. Can More T-shirts. Love that. Yeah, thanks for the merch. It, that right. Seriously, but... Next, I want know, that story I, again. I, I, I think I can speak for Lisa as well. We wake up every morning in the foreignness of this, John. Every day I learn something. I had no idea who Perlo was. Oh, I Tom. had no clue. He's, and this guy was sold to AC too. Milan really? yeah, a yeah, long yeah. time what ago times? for 33 billion Italian lira. That's a lot of money. It's $17 million a million years ago. So one thing that we did at Milan, we let him go to Juventus. Should never have done it. And it was um, a miserable period for me watching What's he Juventus doing now? do well. well see, he's retired now, Tom. But is he coaching or is he like... No, no, know? no. He was coaching Juve. Lasted not too long. <laughs> Didn't go so well. Oh, OK. There were some thoughts that maybe they should have stuck with him. We should get him on the show, Tom. Lisa, every day he we played in some... New York once upon a time. It's just awesome. He did? He did. Mm. He did. We'll get him on the programme, Tom. It's a great painting of him down in Soho on one of the walls. I'll share that with you, TK. I've got a photo. Stuart, this was great. Oh, it's an extra glossy. <laughs> <It's an extra laughs> <glossier. laughs> I said how great Stuart is. He is okay. great. That's really next to glossier, you. don't it's, it's somewhere near glossier. Yeah. <laughs> Greg Vallier of AGF Investments on the debt ceiling without the T-shirts is <clears throat> going to be joining us shortly. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy meet again this week to try to break the impasse over raising the debt ceiling. Another con other congressional leaders will also take part in Tuesday's meeting. Now, if the borrowing limit isn't raised, the U.S. could default on its debt. McCarthy has said any change to the limit is contingent on a budget deal. In Turkey, there could be a runoff in an election that's testing President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's two decades in power. Preliminary results show Erdogan with a lead of more than two million votes. But that's not enough to avoid a second round of voting. A runoff would pit Erdogan against Kemal Kilik Derulu, which has the backing of the nation's broadest ever grouping of opposition parties. In Thailand, a big victory for pro-democracy parties in Sunday's parliamentary elections. And that sets up the biggest challenge to the royalist-backed establishment since the military seized power in a coup nearly a decade ago. The Move Forward Party wants to change a law that restricts criticism of Thailand's powerful monarchy. A big transaction in the oil pipeline business. One Oak has agreed to buy Magellan Midstream Partners in an $18.8 billion cash and stock deal. It would create one of the largest oil and natural gas pipeline operations in the U.S. That price represents a 22 percent premium to Magellan's closing price on Friday. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The staff is very engaged. I would characterize uh, the engagement as serious, uh, as constructive. When I talk to CEOs, to business leaders around the country, mm -hmm. they tell me things are actually going very well. But their biggest concern is that Congress might fail to prevent default and that that would be 
catastrophic. A new role for Leo Brainerd, the director of the National Economic Council. Of course, she was the vice chair of the Federal Reserve. Speaking on CBS's Face the Nation over the weekend, saying the talks were ongoing, some on a staff level, they were constructive. Then it's on to tomorrow right. between Speaker McCarthy and the president. Can you imagine someone that able going into a room and saying, OK, this is the way you speak as a vice chair. <laughs> now, these are the 10 key words to say repeatedly as the NEC head. I mean, what a shift in cadence to see there. Well, if you want to talk to anyone about a shift in cadence, talk to former chair Yan and Tom about how things oh, are going yeah. running the Treasury. Just it, a different, different beast. It, it really is. And, and for our international audience, the tradition of the Secretary of Treasury really going back forever has been at some corporate type. It's a suit and tie, you know, a corporate business type. And then there's a PhD economist who owns labor economics. So that's where we are on that. It is a Washington that we're spinning our head on. John, notice a two-year yield, 4.01% yeah. right now. I just wanted to say that Stuart Kaiser City was great in the last segment. Also reliably informed that PLO is now at a Turkish club managing. Oh, so OK. There you go. OK, thank you. Ties Maybe. into the day's Any, news. Anytime. Exactly, if you want to talk that about it. That was the reason why we Kiki had an election. Kiki could probably make an election. why we shifted yeah. towards PLO. Make an election so appearance there. And <laughs> with, with the tension of the Turkish election, he could make an appearance for yes. one of the candidates. Yes, we could get some commentary from put it an athlete I think on it something says very a serious trip. that sounds like a different network. Saving us is Greg Vallier, <laughs> chief U.S. policy <laughs> strategist at AGF <laughs> Investments, who briefs us on Washington uh, this morning. Uh, Greg, you and I within the five, six stories, and yes, uh, uh, Dr. Brainerd talking there about the debt ceiling. You and I were looking at Ukraine and maybe the most important week for Mr. Putin since February of a year ago. Putin's fighting his military. Putin is fighting the so-called mercenaries assisting him. And it's all happening in a battle which feels like the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. It's quite a story, Tom. Uh, this weekend, Zelensky got assurances of more military aid from Western Europe. Uh, as you say, he's fighting with the Wagner uh, mercenaries. But I think the big story is Bakhmut, which is this horrible, uh, bloody fighting that's gone on for months, uh, I think is now leading to some advances by the Ukrainian forces. What struck me over the weekend, Tom, was film of Russian soldiers fleeing, maybe mm -hmm. like 1917, 1918, when they fled Europe at the end of World War I. If the Russian troops are fleeing, that's a really dramatic story. Bring it back to domestic politics here and that there is a theme of for Ukraine against Ukraine. Is that an election issue or does that drift away towards November of 2024? It's a long way away, obviously, but and Trump inflamed things in, in, on many fronts in the CNN interview. But one of the things Trump inflamed on was, of course, his lack of support for Ukraine. I think that will run into significant resistance among most Republicans. Greg, I just want to build on what you were talking about, that this could be one of the most significant developments, the most important stories out there, if Russian troops really are abandoning ship. Do you feel like there has been a material shift in this war where Ukraine is making headway that perhaps is underappreciated in the market? Could be. Hard to say. What, what, what's the old saying? The first casualty of war is the truth. So it's hard to say who's telling the truth. But I, I do sense a... a dramatic drop of morale, not just in the mercenaries from Wagner, but I think in, among Russian troops in general. We're going to be watching this really closely, especially uh, given the potential shift over in Turkey and what that means for Ukraine's potential NATO, NATO membership. Back in the U.S., we have been talking about the debt ceiling limit, and I know that people don't really want to talk about it because there's not really a new angle on it. But what do you make of this timeline that we have where President Biden has to get something together before he heads off to G7? And we're kind of shifting forward the time frame based on a lack of tax receipts received by the U.S. government. Well, I tell you, Lisa, there's a risk of a fake out here, of getting too optimistic. Everybody this morning is saying they had a good weekend. I think there is agreement on certain big concepts like a uh, cap on spending, uh, clawing back some money from COVID. That's encouraging to see. But these are complicated issues that could take weeks to fully resolve. So I think that there won't be a deal on Tuesday. That's out of the question. Maybe a comment that they're getting closer. But after Biden comes back from his Asian trip, it could still take a few weeks to iron out all the details. Therefore, I think they have mm -hmm. to have an extension. 
just as one example, Greg, away from the uh, public program, Social Security and all that everybody's focused on, what does all this ballet mean for the Pentagon? I think they're still going to get an increase. You know, they got almost 10 percent in this f new fiscal year that started on October 1. I don't think they're going to get 10 percent in the next year's budget, maybe 5 or 6 percent. But I don't see them getting a big haircut. And one of the reasons, of course, is uh, Biden's desire to spend more money on Ukraine. Well, the, the, it seems to be everybody's desire to spend it. And yet there's this narrow part of, I'm going to say, a Republican Party, maybe joined by the left as well, that wants to be isolationist. I, I mean, we've been we've dealt with this for our entire lives. Does it ever get any traction in America witnessed through the Pentagon budget? I think the center holds on this. You've got a lot of Republicans, not just Lindsey Graham and Mitch Ron <laughs> Mitt Romney. You've got a lot of Republicans who want to keep up the defense spending and with Joe Biden, enough Democrats. So I think the center holds on this issue. Hey, Greg, we're all trying to work out where the spending cuts might come from to make a forecast on what the economy might look like. Greg, have you got any kind of base case whatsoever on where they might come from, how big they might be, and what it might mean for growth? Yeah, John, I, I think you're, you're going to see a cap on spending. I think that's very likely. They're just arguing over how much. Is it 2%, 4%, or is it zero? I, I don't think it's going to be zero. There will be some kind of a cap. They'll claw back on COVID aid. Uh, there are several other things that are uh, on the table now, including if you want food stamps or federal benefits, you have to be willing uh, to work. So I, I, I think you get it. Overall, for the macro economy, I think it will be a slight headwind. Greg Vallier of AGF Investments. Greg, thank you. All of that dependent, Tom, of course, on how long this goes on for. Well, it's year two. This is really important. And in any war, there's the first three months, six months, and everybody's got a theory, and then the theory drifts away. And now we're, what, March, February 2, add for 14 months into this, I'm going to say, and all of a sudden the theories are drifting away, and it's just ugly. Can I share this story from the journal this morning? Really <clears throat> interesting read for a lot of people here in the United States. The Biden administration is considering creating a government-run alternative to TurboTax, Tom, drawing resistance from Republicans and companies fearing a loss of business. This story goes on to say, Democrats and consumer advocates have been pushing uh. for the Internal Revenue Service to offer free online tax filing on its website, particularly for people with straightforward <clears throat> returns. Their core argument, tax preparation companies charge middle-income Americans for what advocates think should be a free public service. Didn't we talk about this literally two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Yes, I might use TurboTax myself. But, but do, you not, do you not think that they are going in the right direction? Doesn't that make sense? Shouldn't the IRS just be telling us what we owe? And then if you want, totally. if you want them to have some kind of deductions off the back, then you should do the hard work to get those deductions. Do you think they're actually just going to give you a sheet and be like, sign here, and then this is what you... Th they're not going to do it for you. That's the problem. I don't know what they're going to do. I'm just suggesting what they perhaps should do. Right. And then basically you could have a template and if they give you the wrong numbers, well, then that's the IRS giving uh, you the wrong numbers. So, you know, what are they going to do? Audit themselves? I would suggest there are two halves in America. There is a have that is very documented. You know, it's really cookie cutter and all that, John, which is comfortable for this idea. And there's a whole nother have led by people with more opaque, less identifiable income and expenses and hugely represented by not not only Republicans, but Democrats, but particularly Republicans. And they're like, no, we don't want to change it. And that's all there is to it. There's some companies that's that it. have an interest in not changing it. A <clears throat> couple. Either. I, yeah. I, I went through the <laughs> exercise. Make a lot of money. How far back do you <laughs> keep do. your yeah. taxes? How far back do you keep your taxes? It's, it's meant to be five years, isn't it? Seven years, ten years. I don't know. I'm shredding them this weekend. I, I got the shredder going with vet what, bill. From seven We're years ago? Yeah. I have it all online. I have no idea what's in my tax forms. It's like that thick, and I don't have a clue <laughs> what's in there. Lisa, just preparing some single-name stories for you. I'll give you the top-line stuff in the equity market at the moment on the S&P 500, positive by 0.35% on the S&P. Retail sales tomorrow, target the day after. You get Walmart on Thursday. Look out for all of that on the Nasdaq, positive 0.3%. Interesting mix on the S&P 500 versus, say, the regional banks. Regional banks hammered last week down by more than 6% on the KRX index much followed of course over the last couple of months <clears throat> the s p 500 just about negative by 0.3 percent and looking to erase some of that early this yeah. morning in the bond market you mentioned a two-year tom yields up back through four 
up a basis point, 4% again on a two-year. Swinging away in a tight range, as uh, Stuart Kaiser calls it, a painful range. Joe Light over at Barron's. John, I know you read Barron's cover to cover every week. He's calling it Merger Monday. I mean, that's where we are. It's been underplayed with all the other news going on, Turkey, da 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 But guess what? It is a thir- I got $39 billion. Gold miners at the epicenter of some of that, Bramo. Was it Newmont, Newcrest yep. in the mix? That's right. Newmont uh, purchasing, agreeing to purchase uh, Newcrest. And you can see those shares are uh, just uh, not really doing that much, gaining about eight-tenths of a percent. We'll get to that in one second. I want to go back to the story that you mentioned, the Wall Street Journal story, talking about how the IRS could be considering uh, creating its own tax service. Not a lot of details in terms of what this would entail, but it would eviscerate the business models of some of the tax preparation companies. I think of H&R Block, uh, as well as Intuit, which is one of the online providers of this program. How much could this make it really easier and annihilate these business models without some lawsuits? I think this is actually a fascinating case. Would they basically take the liability of a, a bad preparation on their books? This is interesting to me. 8.7% decline for H&R Block and a 4.5% for Intuit. And you were talking about the Newmont, uh, Newcrest kind of tie-up. I have to think scale matters, which is what you guys were talking about, eight-tenths of a percent time. gain here. How much is this going to be what we're going to be seeing uh, on an ongoing basis as it makes more and more sense? Saw it with Barrick and Rand Gold a couple of years back. Unsurprising we're seeing it here. From what I understand from a lot of people who follow this stuff closely over in London and the city, Tom, because mining's so big over there. Of course, this is all about not just scale, but obviously getting exposure to copper, which is the energy transition trade as well. And that's what Newcrest offers to Newmont. It's $19.2 billion deal. It is the Australian rival, the tie-up here uh, happening. And this is really going to be an interesting uh, deal because this is the biggest bullion producer now in the world. I I, I think this size and the scale, I believe these two transactions, the one in natural gas this morning is is like $30 billion plus, is the same of a small business on Third Avenue. Money costs something now. Doesn't matter if you're running your small business off a charge card on Third Avenue or you're doing the kind of mega trades we're talking about. It's all the same. Guess Just a final word on, on the yeah. tax filing story as well, Tom. <clears throat> this is a great example of why people get so frustrated with Washington, D.C., is that this is not the first time you've seen a proposal like this. And yet these things often don't happen because the lobbyists step in and the companies don't want them to happen. And I think that's just a great shame that you can have something that's going to benefit a big, big part of society every single year in a major way. And yet it's not going to happen because you get these companies out that don't want it to happen and can lean on politicians in Washington to make sure it doesn't. I will reserve judgment before I see them come in, but that's exactly what you would expect them to do because basically you'll have these big businesses that will just essentially not have a business model unless they provide some other service. But to your point, why can't we just do that? Press a button, you pay your taxes, you're done. It should be much easier. It should be much, much easier. The, the heritage of the country. And, and, John, as you've mentioned before, I think it's a little bit easier in the United Kingdom to say uh, the least. We need to recalibrate here in the middle of May. We do that with Gene Tenuso now, Global Head of Fixed Income, Columbia Threadneedle. Gene, thank you so much for recalibrating with us this morning. How much cash do you have right now? Are you in love with cash at 4.43%? Well, if we look at the bond market right now, Tom, cash is our biggest competitor, right? You know, you look at 5% deposit <clears throat> yields, and that's a that's a tough customer relative to what we can get in the bond market in a 3.5% tenure. But we would argue that there's still a very compelling argument to be invested in the bond market. But if you look at the summer, what's ahead of us in terms of uh, the banking malaise and the debt ceiling, right. we are holding a little bit more cash than we have been. Uh, by a couple percentage points across most portfolios. Is an institutional certitude, the duration, the length of maturity of an institutional portfolio is much shorter than what retail does? Is retail making a big, big mistake now out at, say, seven years, 10 year, dare I say, 15 year duration? Is they, Those are the old habits of another time? Well, I think retail is doing exactly, you know, acting very rationally and taking advantage of much higher yields that they aren't able to get in checkable deposits, uh, which have been at zero percent and remain quite low. So they're they're taking money and putting it in CDs and and short term uh, uh, interest bearing uh, money market type funds at a five percent yield or so. But what they're forgetting is reinvestment risk. And I think it's going to become very important that, you know, over the next couple of years, you know, rates may not stay here uh, for a long period of time. And eventually, as they migrate lower, 
you're going to want to lock in longer term uh, yields in, in longer term assets. Jane, over in the equity space, we were speaking with Stuart Kaiser of Citigroup, and he was talking about this painful trading range that has really just paired a, a toxic combination of both volatility and big whipsaw swings in equity valuations. Are you seeing the same kind of painful trading ranges in certain fixed income instruments, or is it much more reliable, much more consistent, and actually getting much less volatile than it has been over the past 12 months? Well, we have seen a pretty wide trading range with more volatility actually at the front end of the curve, but we're also seeing more volatility within corporate credit where that dispersion is getting much larger than it was last year. To us, that might actually be the most important story of the year, Lisa, so far. Last year, it didn't matter if you were in treasuries, investment grade credit, municipal bonds, or high yield, they were all down somewhere around 15%. This year, what we're seeing is that companies with better balance sheets are performing better. If you see what's going on with the banks, the weaker hands are certainly performing more poorly. And we're seeing that differentiation. I think you know, trying to be able to capture that is is really the mission of the year. So there's this debate right now, and Torsten Slack of Apollo just put out some decks basically saying high yield spreads are way too tight. They should be much wider, basically a view that there should be greater credit deterioration going forward. Other people have made the same claim, the sort of sanguine feeling in bonds doesn't reflect some of the angst that you're seeing elsewhere in markets. Do you still think that credit is the smart area of markets, that that is the area that's sort of the tea leaf for what's to come and it seems pretty optimistic. Actually, I, I think that's not the correct read. I, I think overall there are opportunities in credit. If I look at the investment grade index at 145 basis points over treasuries, that's cheaper than its long-term average at a time when leverage on company balance sheets are is lower than it was before COVID. If you look at the high yield market, yes, I think spreads could go a little bit wider, but it's important to remember that that's a much higher quality asset class than it was a few years ago because we have a lot of those fallen angels, those higher quality previously investment grade companies that are now in the high yield market and the lower end of the high yield market. A lot of that uh, has, has gotten a lot smaller because the lower quality, highly levered issuers have gone to the private credit market. So the high yield market as it stands today with its current composition, I think is probably fairly priced to maybe just slightly rich. So, Gene, do you think that perhaps people are overplaying this idea of broader credit tightening in markets? If you're not seeing the stress in some of the riskier companies, if you're not seeing stress in the consumer, and if you're not seeing stress with a whole host of other uh, relative uh, valuations across the market? No, I think the stress is there, but you have to you have to find it. I think it's it exists in private credit. It exists uh, in the banking sector, particularly at the smaller uh, and mid-tier banks. It definitely exists in the commercial real estate market. We're seeing that also impact the regional banks, but uh, also something that's impacting the CMBS market. So the stress is there. It's just perhaps not in the exact same pattern that we may have seen in previous cycles. Uh, Gene, Howard Marks over the weekend of Oak Tree, uh, out with the FT talking about the private markets of debt. The general phrase here, folks, is private credit. And he's really worried about some of the opaqueness there. From where you sit, with huge institutional responsibility, do you have a clear view of what private credit's doing? I uh, certainly don't have the visibility that we have in the public credit markets, Tom, and that's one of the things that makes you nervous. I think the, the sell for private credit is largely that look, we can get you a couple more percentage points of yield relative to public market high yield bonds and you don't have to market to market. A couple of years ago when the high yield bond market was yielding three and a half percent and you could get five and a half or six in private credit, that was almost double and it was pretty attractive. But as you look at it today, particularly most of the private credit market is floating rate. So with so far above five percent, right. Uh, you're looking at you know double digit <clears throat> borrowing costs for a lot of these companies and that's becoming harder for the companies to bear and going to push the default rates a lot higher there when do we see that do you have a calendar item on that i don't mean to the week or the day but can you give us an idea of when we see private credit begin to work out off of that changeable yield that floating rate structure i think it's starting to happen and the observable way we can see it is in the public leverage loan market where defaults are starting to rise now they're at a very low level below two percent last year but definitely moving higher and there are some asset light industries like software for example where when we see those defaults come through the recovery rates for loan holders are a lot lower 
than they were in previous cycles in the bank loan market. So I think that's sort of the uh, the leading indicator. But what's in the private markets is is definitely more opaque. Hey, Gene, thanks for that, mate. As always, Gene Tanusa there of Columbia Threadneedle on a fixed income market. Lisa, how many times have we heard people say credit spreads, high yields should be wider? They should be wider. And you can get behind the reasons why they should be wider, which is why so many people are saying it. But ultimately, they haven't blown out in the way people thought they might. And Gene Denutso really explaining that this is a changed market than 20 years ago because of the private credit market and how much that's backstopped it, because of a lot of very established companies that perhaps were downgraded into junk status but still have a pretty big footprint. This sort of speaks, though, to the... I don't want to, just the opaqueness of this market, this lack of reliable indicators that people used to look at. Because for all the people who say recession, high yield bond, uh, high yield bonds are not screaming recession in the same kind of way. All my radars up on it. It's opaque, opaque, opaque. And I just, I, I, I think to Howard Mark's comments over the weekend. I mean, I think it's a huge deal. I mean, it reminds me of. In 1987, I, I think it was program insurance, I really can't remember. We had no clue what these algorithms were. They were running to hedge against the equity market. Nobody had a clue. Well, Mr. Marx is one man worth listening to. Oh, yeah. When it comes you to lean these forward things. When, you, when Mr. Marx sure. speaks, you lean forward. That's for I, sure. I just think it's in Bramo's wheelhouse, and Gene was brilliant on it there. But it's something we don't talk enough about. He also was saying that there are plenty of opportunities. So this is sort of, uh, you know, both sides of the thing. You're hearing about weakness in private credit, and then you hear the likes of a whole host Howard, of private you know, debt markets. It's coming out and saying it's a golden era. So, you know, Howard, compare these two ideas. Good morning, Howard. Would you just buy the Boston Red Sox? I mean, do a minority interest with Fenway Sports Group. And John, last place. And not good, eh? Again. Yeah, almost as bad as Brutal my AC Milan at the moment. Yeah. They've always got to say there's something to do, right? The day that you get Goldman strategists coming on and saying, look, I've got a, a trade that's going to give you 5% this year, open a Marcus account, and they just walk you through how to open a Marcus account. Is that the future of strategy at Goldman? I, I, 5% returns. I'm, I'm going to I'll, I'll make, a, I'll bet, make a bet with you that that's not going to be the case. Don't they get paid to say there's things to do, right? But, no, but in, in all honesty, Howard Marks always is invested, and he has been. Yeah, no, I'm not even, talking about but, Howard. I'm, yeah, yeah, but like in general, 100% couldn't talk, agree more. Talking about Everybody the south else. side. I mean, you, you're, yes. you're there to make trade Praise. suggestions, aren't you? Yes, 100%. That's <laughs> the whole point. Oscar Munoz, former United Airlines CEO, is going to join us in about three minutes. Looking forward to it. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The political fate of Turkey's president hangs in the balance as he looks headed for a runoff election in two weeks. Preliminary results show Recep Tayyip Erdogan with a lead of more than two million votes, which is not enough to avoid a second round. Now that would pit him against opposition leader Kamal Kilik Darulu. Erdogan has been in power for two decades. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky meets with UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today. The British government says it will be providing Ukraine with hundreds of air defense missiles and hundreds of new long-range attack drones. Over the weekend, Zelensky met separately with leaders of Germany and France. Ford reportedly plans to lay off more than 1,300 workers in China due to plunging sales. That's according to Chinese news media. Ford's market share in China had fallen by more than half since 2016. Consumers are increasingly buying electric vehicles from companies such as Tesla and BYD. Ford says its costs are not competitive. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. You have huge, huge demand. We're, we're about equal to where we were in 2019. Um, but we have 20, between 10 and 20 percent fewer seats available. With demand being so strong and exceeding supply, airlines are pushing up fares and will continue to do so until there's significant pushback. We're all living it. It's getting more expensive and there's been very little pushback to it. Helene Becker there of Cowan speaking in the last week or so from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Your equity market positive by 0.3 percent on the S&P 500, a lift to the equity market, a lift to bond yields as well by a couple of basis points. Your 10 year 348.50. Tons of Fed speak through the week, TK. The big one is Chairman Powell later on this week on Friday. Some data in between retail sales coming up tomorrow morning. 
We'll have to see on the retail sales. I think that really speaks to the buoyancy. I thought Lindsay Piegs was something there about the buoyancy of the consumer. I mean, it's just irrefutable what she sees in the statistics of a non-recessionary America. Mike Gapen saying the same thing over at Bank of America. Credit card mm -hmm. spending, the data they look at, still pretty robust. United no Air big signs of a slowdown there. Yeah, you, and one measurement we use is United Airlines is running at 130% of capacity at Newark. If you want to fly to Boston, they put you on a bus and you drive out past Hackensack. Oh, you're living it, are you? <laughs> you go out. There's so, it's, it's so <laughs> Kirby, it's so successful with United at Newark that they don't have enough gates, so it's like Zurich. They got planes way out, like like you can wave to Pennsylvania. You know, I get very upset when I land in Europe and you've got to get the bus. You know the bus? Yeah, thing. the bus. The bus thing. The bus, the bus thing drives me nuts. Yeah. They have it. Yeah. Did his fault it is? Oscar Minas. It's his fault. He, he did the bus thing? He did the he bus invented thing. the bus thing. It's his fault. <laughs> With us on set, the former United <laughs> Airlines CEO set the table for Mr. Kirby, uh, author of Turnaround Time, United and Airline and its employees in the friendly and sometimes not so friendly skies. Good morning, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, oh, with that kind of lead in, boy. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody is, you know, we talked, Jamie Dimon was on the other day uh, with, with Bloomberg and he had a cancer scare. You lived it. You lived in real time, a medical issue at United Airlines and many people say you handled it better than anybody. For CEOs out there, what was a lesson you learned after a horrific cardiac event while you were on the tour of duty? What'd you learn there? Uh, for me, I learned since I'd only been on the job for 37 days before that occurred, and but I had had a chance to connect with all my employees, or many of them, and uh, the outpouring of affection and support was amazing. And it just confirmed that the organization, the group, the employees in that United family were ready for a set of directions and guidance that would lead us back to where we are today. The airlines today have recovered. I believe they got a massive bailout in the middle of the pandemic. Have they, have they paid back to the government, to the people, that massive bailout? So if I could take just a little contention with the term bailout. I'm just trying, it's <laughs> Monday. It's a slow news day. I'm trying to get it going here. No, it was not a bailout. The, the, the airline industry was in its best state ever, I think, in its history. And we got hit. You know, our, our revenue dropped uh, 97, 93%. So it was a significant issue. To keep the airline working and going so the economy could return is where we did get get loans, and the loans are being repaid over a five- or six-year period. And in that interim period, you're not allowed to do repurchases. You're not allowed to right. increase comp of your senior executive. So you're still working through it. Did plenty of repurchases going into the mess, though? Of course, much of that mess unforeseen. There has been some public pushback about whether you should have received any government loans whatsoever based on that. Do you think we are in a position now where shareholders of United get to own the upside, and perhaps you can't talk directly about the company, but shareholders of the industry group gets to own the upside and perhaps the government doesn't in quite the same way? Well, um, we negotiated fairly and um, and I think I think everyone is going to come out okay at the end of this. I don't think there's anybody that's going to be unfairly advantaged, at least from our perspective. Uh, the airline has taken a lot of its uh, a lot of its tolls. We appreciate the you know the the funds from the U.S. government came at a very perfect time, but it was not free. Uh, Steve Mnuchin was a uh, sec, uh, sec of uh, a finance or, um, was there. And we had uh, some really good conversations and details about what it would look like four or five years later and whether or not it would indeed be fair. So I would say no. Meanwhile, when you talk about what it looks like, the airline industry looks a little different now than it did before the pandemic. And we were just talking about how the front of the cab is all first class and business class and then comfort plus. And then there are like three seats in the back that you can pray to get for some kind of uh, high price that you can jam your family into if you're in economy. Is this the future of flying? It is not because it's not probably the, <laughs> the best representation of what we have today. Yeah, there are multiple classes for different budgets and you try to do as much as you can. I think at, at United, we've tried uh, to put a lot of amenities in the back. So you're not sitting in the back huddled. Um, and there's plenty of <laughs> there's plenty of, uh, of, uh, of entertainment and such. And again, you know, different budgets require different uh, uh, different seating arrangements. And as we've talked, uh, real estate inside an aircraft is very expensive. I think in the book, I try to demystify some of those things, sort of to build a, a bridge between the chasm of understanding by the general flying public and how we run a business. We really aren't in the business of trying to make you 
uncomfortable, late, and all those things. Really, there's a ton of effort no, going the, to not make it so. And, and, and understood, and, and definitely you can sense that. There is this feeling, though, that there is no better example of wealth inequality than flying, because you go and it's like if you pay enough, you can go first, and then you get these extra things, and it's basically you've got to walk past them to get to the back of the cab to sit in your little seat. I'm just wondering if that's going to be sort of even on steroids, because those are so much more profitable now. And actually, relatively speaking, the most profitable possibly ever, those seats in the front of the cab rather than the back. Well, I don't think we're as most profitable ever. I think uh, right before the pandemic was the most profitable time in airline history, and it was a nice array of, of the front uh, first-class product, economy, economy plus, and, of course, the basic economy at the end. And uh, through increased flying, uh, taking people from everywhere they wanted to go to where they needed to go, uh, that combination with volume, demand, and a good level of supply and customer service was really what was creating the revenue generation and the profits. But, again, profits aren't the best in this industry, and, it, and fuel's always volatile, so uh, the equities are always going to be affected by that regard. You parachute into Pepperdine to do a victory lap, and I want you to address right now something really emotional to a lot of our listeners, particularly exactly. This is the coughing side of the table. You're allowed to cough over here. That's, they don't cough over there. We cough over here. I want you to talk about chairman and chief executive officer, like you're on the board at Salesforce with Mr. Benioff. Benioff handles a number of duties as well. It, what's, what's the experience you have of the efficacy of a chairman and CEO being one person? You know, I think it depends on the company and the industry. I've seen it work both ways just fine. And I don't know that there is a degree of, uh, of we tend to, depending on our feeling for it, we tend to lean one way or the other. Again, having been both at one time and having been separate, uh, from my perspective going forward, I think the separation makes sense because governance and the things that we face as, as public companies are pretty significant, and it's good to have sort of a division of authority. Can we talk about lessons, and can we go back to spring of 2017? And you obviously know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. That day that passenger was dragged off the plane how you responded to it at the time. Oscar, when you look back, what were the lessons learned for you personally and for anyone that might find themselves in a similar position in years to come? Yeah, I think, um, and I talk about it all the time because it was a dark point in our, in our tenure there. I think the, probably the biggest lesson, it's never too late to do the right thing. I think our initial response, my initial response, for a lot of different reasons, mostly that it wasn't United Airlines actually involved in any of that you saw, but it was indeed our response, my response that created the issue, and it blew up. And I think we're probably one of the first global brands to have a viral uh, social media issue, and we've tried to find someone else, but I think we may be the ones. Um, and then, uh, you know, going on TV a couple of days later and, you know, taking, taking it on personally. When did you realize what the right thing is. I mean, with hindsight, you and I could sit here now and I could say, this was the right thing, Oscar. Why didn't you do it? When did you know we've got this wrong and we need to write course pretty quickly? Uh, the middle of the night before I went on national TV. Um, again, I, in, the, in the book, I highlight sort of my upbringing, my heritage, and all the things that influence us. Or the formative years. We're all parts of people we've met, as Tennyson says. And uh, I think in the middle of the night, I sort of looked upstairs for some guidance and I felt a calm because I knew I wasn't going to try to blame the Express or somebody out, the Express uh, carrier or other folks. Tell me myself. about International. United Airlines now is in New We've got three airports in New York, folks. You own Newark. I get that. You're boxed out of JFK. Kirby's age dealing with this as well. Is this the future of America, of United States Airlines, and that everybody's going to be fighting for a shortage of gates? Well, there are methods and procedures and policies that can be implemented if we're all willing to do that. That would not rectify, but certainly uh, mollify some of those issues. Uh, you know, EWR is not some place we own at United. For, it's, it's one of the most difficult places to operate, and you've seen big airlines come in and out of there because of that. There's concept of slot control, there's flights oversight, and then right. there's air traffic control and its modernization. You, would you just he needs more flights to Italy? Can you talk to Kirby and make that happen? They fly direct to Naples. Yeah, they fly. Yeah, yeah, I know. And they Porto, and we can go on. <laughs> 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 International flights <laughs> everywhere. It's very expensive they go to, to Naples. <laughs> the F1 race. Cacio Pepe, that's where it is You're this weekend? You're thinking Emilia Romagna. Oh, sorry. That's this me. weekend. So I'm but in, it's a in, good pasta. <laughs> <laughs>
I think the rate hikes from last November haven't even really hit the economy. What's going to have to happen for them to actually cut rates is going to be to start to see cracks in the labor market. For me, the labor market's really key, and the rebalancing that we're mm -hmm. seeing there, I think it's very encouraging. We know the risk of recession is high, but we're not seeing the whites of the eyes of it in hard data. We're not going back to a world that we struggle to get 2% inflation. You know, if we get to 3%, we're lucky. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramos, and Tom Keen on radio and television. It's an odd Monday out there. All sorts of news flow, disparate things here, there, everywhere. But, John, we've got to go to Michael McKee's favorite week of all time. There are 437 Goodness, Fed speakers this week. <laughs> Bostic alone speaks 25 <laughs> times. <laughs> Give me a break. Let me go through the list for you. Bostick Kashkari, Bostick Bostick <laughs> Cook, Mester Bar Williams, Gorsby Logan, Bostick Jefferson Bar Logan, Williams Bowman, Powell Bullard. Keep going. And Bostick. That's just through to and the next Monday. And that doesn't include yeah. Brainerd over at the White House. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's Brainerd's fantastic. still on the list. Do you think by the end of the week we might have a decent picture on where policy's going? Uh, no. I would say <laughs> exactly. that, would be, that would be the answer. And the thing is, they're in the collar, in the band that we've been talking about all morning, the lack of volatility in the equity market finally uh, there. And, John, I see it with a mid-range two-year yield, I guess, just moments ago, 4.02%. It's the in between -y week of May. A jokes aside, Chairman Powell, who will we get? Will we get a Governor Bauman leaning into the idea, maybe? They've got to go a little bit further. Or will we get a Governor Jefferson, which is basically all long and variable lacks and all that pain is still ahead of us? Maybe we're done here. It's going to be interesting to see. Now, they're going to meet. This is important. Powell and Bernanke, in honor of Thomas Laubach, dying tragically of pancreatic cancer at 55. And, folks, this is our start. John Williams gets all the headline, but providing leadership with the head of the New York Fed was Thomas uh, Laubach. And it's real simple. You, you, you go to where we are with Laubach and Williams and then go on to Olivier Blanchard and others' theories now of a reduced our start. And that's a titanic bet. Are we going to get back down to a lower rate, a lower yield regime? All these fuzzy the concepts, though, Tom. Where is neutral? Where is sufficiently restrictive? Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed put it this way. Monetary policy is now at the low end of what is arguably sufficiently restrictive. Right. Given current macroeconomic conditions. Lisa, can we believe in like a 6% three-month T-bill? I mean, no one's looking for the yield structure, short-term paper, to move higher. No one's looking for that. The person who actually we should have asked about that, or we will next time she's on, is Lindsay Piegza, because she actually does forecast some sort of 6% Fed funds rate. I didn't know that. The issue that we're looking at right now, with respect to all of these speakers and Fed policy and, and, and due tightening and long and lags and our starred, is they take a dartboard, throw something at it, and you'd be <clears> just as right with respect to how quickly this economy has gained steam and kept well, it. The stubbornness of this inflation versus the transitory that's become a dirty word. To both of you, and John, let me start with you in that we've got it wrong. And with the Bank of England last week, everybody in City Group of Vasilis Giannakis leading the way, we got it wrong. There's these other factors going on besides conventional bow tie economics. It's not working. There's other issues like technology, demographics, a pandemic, dare I say a war in Ukraine. And you see it in the United Kingdom misguess. There there are plenty of things we got wrong. I think one of the bigger issues that we got wrong in the last 12 months is just how much this economy could tolerate higher interest rates. Yes. Not just the United States, but Europe for that matter too. It was unthinkable for so many people who have followed Europe and the ECB right. specifically for a long, long time that this ECB could get up to two, to three, to four, and the economy wouldn't just collapse. Now, maybe that is right. still... In our future, in the words of Governor Jefferson, maybe that pain is still ahead of us. But right now, it's been surprising for a lot of people. Lisa, F Felix Salmon writing in Axios over the weekend saying, what did he get wrong? And he said he had to wait for COVID to get economy to go. And guess what? The economy went before COVID ended. And we are still here. And it's not coming down. And this is sort of, you talked about, well, it's out there somewhere. Well, it doesn't matter when, right? right? I mean, essentially, and if it doesn't come, at what point do some of the inflation expectations become more entrenched? Let's round it up Monday. My data check, John, to you is simple. 4,200 SPX, 33,000. Dow, 13,000. NASDAQ, 100. It's a horrific equity market. The range holds all through the year, 3,800 <laughs> out to 4,200. And right now at the upper end of it, on the S&P 500 futures positive, 0.4%. Yields a little bit higher by three basis points, 349.44. Some soothing words over the weekend from a range of officials. We aren't at the crunch point. Talks are ongoing at the staff level around the debt ceiling. And, Tom, at the higher level... 
talks will resume tomorrow between the president and Speaker McCarthy. Maybe they'll do that on monetary policy as well. Joining <laughs> Why not? us now, Anders <laughs> Person, CIO, Global Fixed Income at Nuveen, to make sense of this. Make sense of this, Anders. Distill down the Nuveen view, the constructive view, into the end of this year. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, first of all, that there are a lot of crosswinds going on here, as you guys are alluding to. So there's there's plenty for the market to kind of digest here, and, and that's that's arguably what, what's uh, making it interesting at this point. I, I think in, in our seat here, we do uh, feel like now with the Fed hiking cycle either over or nearly over, the main driver for fixed income markets is shifting a bit away from kind of, you know, anticipating what the net, uh, next... Um, move will be for the Fed towards more working around what is the concerns around recessions, what is the kind of path of inflation. So, so really, I think the market is now going to focus a lot more on that as opposed to, okay, what is the next uh, kind of move for the Fed? So that, that's really what we're, we're trying to focus more in on. And, and ultimately, yes, we are constructive as, as we're looking at fixed income medium to long term. But we're also a little bit more cautious here on, on the short term. We do think there could be some spread widening. We think the market's a little bit a little bit generous in terms of Fed uh, cuts coming. We also are keeping out, uh, keeping a close eye on on the debt ceiling uncertainties. Well, Anders, let's look right across the curve. Let's go out from T bills if you want two year. Take your pick at the front end, all the way out to the thirty year. What is the pocket, the maturity that you like right now across the Treasury curve as you anticipate maybe growth slowing and a Fed that's done. Yeah, no, I think I think we're overall. I would say we we become a little bit more neutral in, on duration. Uh, we think that we're actually settled down here a little bit of a of a more of a trading range. I do think the ten year is probably the the most comfort that we have. Probably more so that we are going to be in this sort of three and a half, sorry, three and a quarter to three and three quarter kind of type range for for a bit. We do think that um, the ten year could end up at around three and a quarter by year end. So. Really, more of a, a little bit more of a stable backdrop from that perspective. The front end, given so many uncertainties, given the different paths that we're dealing with, we're a little bit more uncomfortable, uncomfortable there, and certainly think that the thirty is a little bit too too far out there to really make a bet on. So I would say sort of in the middle middle part. But all in all, I think we're finding more uh, comfort going out into the credit space. And kind of taking more on on the risk on on that side versus on the duration side at this point. Anders, how fragile is this market to the idea that inflation truly is sticky? That we're not going back to a two percent reality in the next few years. And I say this as this divergence opens up between uh, forward break-even rates and consumer expectations, as we saw in the University of Michigan survey that came out on Friday. Do you? Really raise this as a potential tail risk at a time when so many people are gleaning comfort in duration. Yeah, no, I would say inflation and recession risk are the two ones that we're the most focused on at this point. We do think that inflation has likely peaked, but we do uh, think it's going to remain too high, I'll, I'll call it, relative to the Fed targets here. Uh, at least throughout this year, we're actually looking at inflation at 3.5% by year end. But but to your point, Lisa, there is a, a little bit of a mismatch here between what we're seeing on the maybe on the consumer side. You know, Michigan survey coming in at 3.2 percent, you know, higher than expectations more broadly. I will note that that number tends to get revised down at times, so perhaps a little bit higher than, than it truly is. And compare that to the break-evens that have been stable to lower, you know, 10-year break-even around 2.2 percent at this point. So we're kind of seeing a little bit of a divergence between what the market is expecting and what maybe we're seeing on the consumer side. And and that that's the the, the mismatch that really want to see that, that kind of get a little bit more of a, of a stable environment going forward. So yeah. all in all, we're, we're in the camp that inflation is going to stay a little bit stickier than expectations. That's why we are not expecting the Fed to move anytime soon. We think the Fed's going to remain very focused on that part. And while we're seeing, you know, basically cuts being priced in in the markets by year end, we're expecting that to, uh, to be too optimistic at this point. Anders, thanks for the viewpoint, sir. Anders person there of Nuveen. Brown, Anders is one of those people you call when things are going nuts. And you just need someone <laughs> to just to remain calm.
about what's happening Wait. in fixed income at the moment. Are you suggesting that I'm not the person no, you call? I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> like, don't call oh me. Oh, my God, the don't world's call, falling don't, apart. Don't, don't no. call me either. No, I mean, honestly, when, when things fall apart, he'll be like, well, if you take a look, it's a potential risk, but it's not yeah. that big of a deal. I mean, or, or it is, but we can, we can manage through it. This has been sort of the feeling that we've gotten with the confidence in duration from so many fund managers. And to me, this is fascinating. The tail risks be what they may, but people still, uh, developed market bonds still seem to be the bright spot. Even with this debt ceiling nonsense. Exactly. <laughs> even with this big, big debate down in Washington, D.C. I think it was Luke Hickmore of Aberdeen last week. I said, OK, big question. I think it's the only question that matters for any fixed income strategist right now, anyone in the bond market. If things hit the fan in Washington, you were a buyer or a seller of treasuries. And he said, not the 10-year, the five-year. What's the five-year? The five-year, the belly of the curve. That's... That's what he's after. If things hit the totally fan, agree. that's the pocket of the yeah. curve that he wants to buy. I, I totally agree on the duration. Now it's nonlinear. All the focus in the media is obviously the benchmark 10-year used to be the 30-year. And all inside Fed speak like. And in the belly is a tradition five to seven year duration is really where you want to go. Can I mention what we haven't talked about today, which we have to do another uh, week of bank repair confidence. And I'm not sure how that goes this week, other than to say, oops, it seems like we have a pretty good economy. I guess that helps. But, you know, sometimes it's not the news, folks. It's what's not said. Over the weekend, nothing was said about the banks. That's, that's April's problem. It's gone. It's a business model problem from now on. Funding costs are higher. Assets are still in a tough position. At least the regulatory environment for some of these names is going to get even more difficult. The outlook for profits has got really tricky as well. Give me the reason to buy. There was no discussion about the change in bank deposits that we got on Friday, which I thought was interesting. Another uh, $13 billion decline, almost $14 billion dollar decline in bank deposits. That. Just this grind, a slow grind that, again, challenges the business model. And not just the return off capital, but return on. It's just another weekend of people sitting around the table with their families, whoever, getting advice and saying, yeah, we should maybe buy some T-bills. Buy a money market fund on Monday. Apple card that gets your Get an cash. Apple card, <clears throat> you know. Didn't you have this conversation at home? I may have had this conversation. Right? Yes, yes. yes. It's, it's, this precise it's, it's titanium. Did you it see the way she went you at, John, did you see the way <laughs> Miss Abramowitz went after Mr. Munoz over economy seating on airplanes? Know, unhappy about it. Have it you ever flown like, children on a plane? I'm just saying, theoretically, the expense is high. <laughs> Let's move on. We can move just, on. Just, I can get you out of this. Thank you. Laura Rain comes up at 8 30. Laura only flies business class. <laughs> She'll be with us in about 18 minutes from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy meet again this week to try to break the impasse over raising the debt ceiling. Other congressional leaders will also take part in Tuesday's meeting. If the borrowing limit isn't raised, the U.S. could default on its debt. McCarthy has said any change to the limit is contingent on a budget deal. In Turkey, there could be a runoff in an election that's testing President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's two decades of power. Preliminary results show Erdogan with a lead of more than two million votes. But that's not enough to avoid a second round of voting. A runoff would pit Erdogan against Kemal Kilik Derulo, which has the backing of the nation's broadest ever grouping of opposition parties. In Thailand, a big victory for pro-democracy parties in Sunday's parliamentary elections. Now, that sets up the biggest challenge to the royalist-backed establishment since the military seized power in a coup nearly a decade ago. The Move Forward party wants to change a law that restricts criticism of Thailand's powerful monarchy. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The Fed has done a very good job of continuing to support the economy while raising rates and trying to tame inflation. And so this delicate balance has allowed, I think, the consumer to continue to stay afloat, which pushes out our recession call to the end of the year. 
<laughs> I'm sure that whatever Lindsay Piegs had just said there was really interesting, but Bramo's story in the commercial break was just We got to go sports. Riveting. We got to go sports. We got to go big <clears throat> little during the ads. and, then and be Just quiet. a Bramo count. Let's we move have on. To, we have to <laughs> right. you. Let's just move on. <laughs> we have to introduce you before you can talk, okay? There, but but you know I look I, I look John at what we're doing here and it's like a Damien Sassar. Never come back. Let's bring in Damien Sassar <laughs> right now. Okay, you can talk now. Wonderful. Nice to see you both. Good to Thanks. see you. Good to see you too. See you. Yeah, mean, thank you. Good. That was good. <laughs> the, the, Damien, the, the, the whole ad thing of sports where they show the action in the commercial break. Do you yeah. think it would work for surveillance? I think it would work for emerging markets. Is what I think it would work for Tom because okay. I, you know I'm kidding. Look, I think for surveillance, yeah. I mean, you have like maybe okay. maybe I could be in a sound booth and I can play music kind of like a Howard Stern show so every time you you know you guys say something that you know your audience is used to hearing I can have that little sound in the background I, I'd like That's to great. do that for you guys let's reset yeah. John go to the data <laughs> and let's explain why Damien's here Turkey <laughs> Turkey front and center yeah. the prospect of a, a runoff something that Erdogan hasn't had to deal with yeah in recent times how important is this do Damien we... what's emerging over there in Turkey right now do we really think that Erdogan's not going to be around in two weeks from now? I mean, did the markets really, really believe that? I mean, look, I coached the Rolu to his credit and the CHP, which is the centrist, uh, that's going to the runoff against Erdogan. I mean, you know, great job. But, I mean, let's be clear. Erdogan has nine lives, and that country is wholly financed by Middle East and Russian money now. And so there's a lot of offshore interests in that economy that go so far beyond foreign creditors in the U.S. and the West. So, for me, this is nothing new. This is basically a man who has nine lives. He's the longest strong man in the, East, in the European Union. I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. It's going to be very, very difficult for them to displace him. I love how you say, you know, they got to run off. Good job, but yeah. it's not going to get anywhere. Yeah. Here's my question. We all think of this as a potential positive shift for Turkey yeah. if there should be some sort of surprise or the status quo if Erdogan remains in office. Is it status quo or is it something different if he remains after all of the years in power and then yet another election? You know, I mean, that's a great question. I think really, I mean, the populace is really voting with defense. They're voting with national security. They don't, I mean, look, the economy and inflation and all that out the door. I mean, this is about Kurds, the migrant crisis. You know, this is about the MHP, the alliance between uh, Kurdish Darolu and the MHP, which is one-fifth of the population of Turkey, of their 85 million people, are Kurdish, right? So these are all fundamental issues to, Tur to Turkey, and I think that's really what's supporting the bid for the AKP. You, man you managed... Uh, you you, met, you you mentioned uh, the monetary policy here, and, yeah. and John was talking about this earlier, how there was a sort of unconventional approach that Erdogan has taken, which is, in response to inflation, you cut <laughs> interest rates because that will bring inflation down. Will that shift after this election? You know, I mean, it would, obviously, if uh, the CHP wins. But, I, I mean, again, you know, Erdogan has nine lives. You know, he, uh, you know, he doesn't seem like he's going to shift in terms of uh, monetary policy and in terms of the way the economy is being managed. And he has complete control right now and autonomy to do pretty much whatever he wants. And so we expect over the next two weeks into the runoff to be a lot more interventions. I think there's been $150 billion of mm -hmm. interventions by the Central Bank of Turkey over the last 16 months alone to support the currency. I mean, think about all, all right. that savings that's been washed away. It's just such a tragedy. And all these idiosyncratic opportunities, Argentina's move, Turkey's move, the one that really hasn't moved to me is Thai Bot. There's mm. an election over there. We don't need to go into the details. The answer is it's a huge deal, not only for Thailand, but for Southeast Asia. Yes. Stability. Is there a big figure move here and strong bot that hasn't happened yet? You know, it, there absolutely is. And it's not really due to, again, the idiosyncrasies of what's going on in Thailand. Right. It's due to the potential for a carry trade unwind. Let's just take a step back and see where we are. Look at Russell S&P ratios. Look at gold oil ratios. Look at five-year, 30-year in the U.S., all signaling very late cycle, <laughs> end of cycle. So if we are there, then the carry trade unwind is moments away after that, right? And the Thai bot has been a funding currency along with the Korean won and the Malaysian ringgit, all those low-yielding Asian currencies. So if we see a reverse of what we've seen year-to-date, which is all these high-carry currencies mm -hmm. outperforming, it's the Thai bot and those low funding currencies that are going to rip in everyone's face. To review this for non-sophisticates like me, we go back to strong bot back to pre-pandemic. Yeah. Well, that, right? we, well uh, pre-pandemic was, oh, I don't know, it was at 38 probably, I don't know, six months ago. Now we're at 32 Thai bot, I mean, which is kind of fair value over the last five years. But you're right, it could go, you know, as low as 30 back, you know, into a 29 handle. you realize I completely made that up? I'm sure he's just been polite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's absolutely convinced. No, but I think, you, I think, look, the funding currencies are a good trade if you're thinking it's a, it's sort of an end of the world scenario here where the U.S. goes back into recession and all the stuff we've seen in the S&P is, is a farce. Can we throw in Argentina? 
Argentina, yeah, we're going to see another, what, 600 basis 600 point rate basis hike? Points. Is that what they're called? After 1,000 um, in later, close, later close to 100%, Damien. Uh, interest uh, rates. What's going on there? Yeah, yeah. Um, the blue chip swap rate, which is their currency, their de facto currency, the uh, the um, the non official rate is um, down thirty five percent of the dollar year to date. So the currency is meaningless. I think we have this election coming up. You know, Tom and I were just talking about Patricia Bullrich, who is leading in the polls. There, she is proposing a sort of bi monetary kind of policy where it's along the lines of an Uruguay or a Peru where it's sort of a dollarized economy, not really. And they've got $44 billion with tied up with the IMF that they need to rework. And the IMF is not talking to the Fernandez administration. So there's a lot of hair there. Argentina might be an idiosyncratic story, as we were talking about earlier. I want to talk about Turkey and then what we saw in Thailand. And more broadly, are we seeing a shift to more democratic types of governments in some of these developing markets that are only giving a tailwind to some of the emerging market trade that some people have been piling into so far this year? Well, I think they're making a last-ditch effort, right? We have seen that populist shift, certainly in Latin America over the better part of the last few years, to see something more, uh, pivot more toward a capital or just sort of a democratic democratic-based, um, you know, political regime like we're seeing in Thailand, I think is novel. I think it's amazing. Certainly in Turkey, we're seeing a little bit of that. But I, I just, again, I just think there's so much structurally in Turkey to prevent democracy from really getting its footing there. I think that's the real issue there, unfortunately. Damien, thank you, sir. As always, Damien Sasser there of Bloomberg Intelligence, starting with Turkey, ending with Turkey. Piotr Matis out of London, who was with Rabobank, he's now with InTouch Capital Markets. Used to follow him plenty when I was back in London number of years ago. He said this, those expecting the central bank to make a U-turn, Lisa, and raise interest rates markedly after the elections could end up being disappointed, <laughs> I think, to put it mildly. There's, the well, yes, there's the election and who's going to actually win in the end. But then there's also how quickly can you really make an about face, given that it is incredibly politically sensitive. I mean, if suddenly people have to pay that much more to borrow money, it becomes rather complicated from a populist kind of standpoint. That issue in Argentina, Tom. It's just brutal. That is brutal I, stuff. I would say the summation of all my conversations around the World Bank IMF meetings was idiosyncratic doesn't really capture what Damien said, which is the size of help that's already be give, been given is truly unimaginable. They, they basically bet the house on helping Argentina and got slapped in the face. In the next hour, we'll move on from EM and slaps in the face. Colin Martin of Charles Schwab. Sam Linton Brown of BNP Paribas, <laughs> Gaggy Chowdhury of BlackRock, three very smart individuals on this bond market and beyond. You can't do that. You're like, we're going to move on from absolutely everything that you just saw over here. And we're going to actually talk, on gonna talk about you know, things like <laughs> equities and That's literally bonds and other things that actually trade and make. Yeah, things that matter at 9.30 Eastern time. But, okay, carry on. Can we, you know what I learned today, which is what great? What did you I mean, learn today? With Damien, Please. I'm taking Please notes. someone learned something here. I, I'm glad I learned something. I had no idea of the midfield of Juventus oh, wow. years ago, which was sort of like the ginormous, you know, it was like Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. It was, Conti was the coach. Right. And there was a guy you introduced me to today, Pirlo. There was Vidal. Yeah, Pogba. And somebody else I can't remember. Pogba, Marquisio. Yeah, yeah. Was that like the best midfield ever? It was one of the best sides out there. I think that team, I think it was that team that came undone against Barcelona. The Neymar, Suarez, Messi, Barcelona, if I remember correctly. I think it was that side. But, I mean, it's completely foreigners, but it's like Garrig and Ruth or, you know, other you know, other things we've done. I mean, it's extraordinary what they did. I'm pleased you found out who Andrea Pirlo is. I did. You know, I mean, he, it's he the just, highlight of my you, day. You, you Am I doing okay, Damien? You're doing all right. Very Can well. I come Next, back? Next time he's in <laughs> New well. York, TK, we'll get him on the program. All right? We'll work that out. Yeah. Road trip. Big, big fan of Bloomberg surveillance on reliable <laughs> form. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> On radio, on television, Bloomberg Surveillance. We're thrilled you're with us on a Monday. Retail sales tomorrow. We haven't talked enough about that. Get to that in a moment. And the data front is simple. Little lift to equities. Don't know what to do with it with the VIX, 17.47. A little bit of lift to yields over the last 120 minutes, 4.01%. Two-year, uh, three basis points on the 10-year yield, out to 3.50%. A little higher yield uh, regime there. I do want to point out, I had a sudden print of 69 handle on West Texas Intermediate, $70.63 uh, right now. 
And Lisa, retail sales tomorrow, we just haven't talked enough about it. I mean, it is what it is. It's the state of the consumer. Yeah, especially before Home Depot and then Target and then Walmart <clears throat> coming in on Thursday. I do want to bring you this news. Uh, so the Empire Manufacturing Survey, which really gives the first read on manufacturing uh, of any of the surveys for New York, <clears throat> oh, <it's> came <laughs> in a negative 31.8 versus the expectations from negative 3.9. So it was expected to deteriorate, but not nearly as much <clears throat> as it did. Again, how much does this really fly in the face of the optimism that we saw in the prior read yeah. for this? Basically, the sense that perhaps it was short lived. This is the biggest decline going back to October. So, really, a sense that perhaps things are not all sanguine. Yeah. Bramowitz keeping us uh, going here, folks, because I said the two year yield was 4.01, 4.02%. That was long ago and far away. That was at least 45 seconds ago. Yeah. 3.9789 on the two year yield. We have moved three big figures, even four big figures on the uh, two-year yield just off that Buffalo, New York shock. Yeah, this idea of the long and variable lags perhaps are, are taking uh, hold. We will have better sense as some of the data uh, continues to ripple through. In the meantime, it really has been the debt ceiling front and center with Biden and McCarthy planning to meet on Tuesday, the two of them, the uh, romantic Oval Office meeting that you talk about, Tom. Laura Rame of FS Investments weighing in, not on the romance of it, but rather on her expectation, quote, that we will eventually raise the debt ceiling. My concern is that it will occur only after we have accidentally tripped into technical default due to a miscalculation on one or both sides, Tom. <clears throat> a big concern, given the fact that so many people just believe it's a done deal, that they will get something through, and it won't be a market-moving event after all. Market-moving is the key phrase here, and I'm doing it right now. Folks, you can do this on the Bloomberg Professional uh, Service. I'm going to go back. Laura Ram knows I can do this. I mean, she's got us down cold. And, Laura, we're now down just through two standard deviations of weakness on the empire manufacturing statistic. It's a tertiary number. The fact is it moved the market this morning. The fact is it's wrapped around this fiscal ballet in Washington. How unpredictable is it out there? Right now, because there's a vacuum of other big news, I think that we're seeing these smaller data points really have outsized impact. And that's a big move. What we are seeing is the current data looking still pretty solid, but the forward-looking stuff is starting to get uh, more concerning. My expectation, and you guys know this for a long time now, I've been saying recession probably the end of this coming year. And given that that's my expectation, I would start to see some of these forward-looking things right. start to deteriorate about now. What tools are you using at FS Investments to determine which way we move in the collared band we're in right now? So the tools that we're using really are for managing either side of that band. Look, volatility in the Treasury market is acute. It's not visible at the actual moment, but the fact that we got the move uh, index at its highest level this year, not during the pandemic, not during COVID, it really peaked now, I think is something we need to pay attention to. And I think the problem right now for me, for every investor, is it could break in either direction. The problem with the debt ceiling negotiations is that even though it puts treasuries at risk, the market reaction is to buy treasuries. It's the safe haven. So I think there's as much chance that we could actually move lower in yields on the back of some disappointment in the debt ceiling or some disappointment in resolution versus the upside. And yet you still got, you know, inflation. I'm in the camp that it's not going to go neatly back to 2%. I think there's another upside surprise waiting out there in the inflation data. I think that could easily push you higher too. So the tools are designed around managing for the fact that it is highly uncertain which side it's going to break to right now. There's a lot there to unpack, Laura, and I do want to get to this idea that you could see uh, inflation break out to the upside in just a second. But just hanging on to the debt ceiling debate, given a sense that you'd expect there could be a technical default, eventually, yes, a resolution, but the technical default could create a real issue. Is that sort of what could send yields lower? Is that basically what the implication would be from that? Or is, a, is there a longer term consequence to such a technical default? Oh, there's absolutely a longer term consequence. And 
You know, it's been building. I think, you know, we've seen globally the dollars erode somewhat as a reserve currency. That continues to be a drumbeat that is told not in quarters or weeks, but in years. And um, unfortunately, things like the debt ceiling are a self-inflicted wound on dollar sovereignty around the globe. So when you think about what that means, you know, the U.S. has managed to have this position where we can just issue debt because we're sort of the global reserve currency and and we're the global bond oasis in times of concern. But looking ahead, you, I think, risk a world where Treasury yields could move higher. You know, the Fed's not going to go back to zero anytime soon. And, you know, you're really looking at the forward dynamics of debt payments looking pretty difficult in the U.S. It's all gearing towards higher long-run debt. Not this year, but I think that's something that we're going to be dealing with going forward. It's certainly going to be a big election issue. So the the point is that near term, we have some downward pressure on yields, yeah. but s- secularly, we have this longer term pressure. And against the backdrop, we have no treasury market liquidity. That's a real concern that has been sparking acute volatility. Laura, you talk about there could be a surprise in inflation to the upside. And I want to pair that idea with what we just saw out of New York manufacturing, this index that actually plunged doing the calculations, Bloomberg did them the most in three years, more than three years. How does that dovetail with this idea that we could be surprised by how resilient the pricing pressure really is? I think we need to be aware of the manufacturer, the empire manufacturing data, but it is one piece of a lot of regional numbers that we look at. So um, I want to really focus the conversation on the fact that inflation in the U.S. is really consumer driven. Mm-hmm. I think right now companies are still riding off of a wave of euphoria where they're able to take more pricing power. I think we will be watching the earnings closely because we've seen a lot of consumer-based companies keep that pricing power. That keeps the inflation. That's another piece of this entrenched uh, inflation piece. So I think the manufacturing numbers are important. They are a leading indicator of sentiment. But given the importance of the household in our economy, that's, to me, the real source of it. On radio and television, and for joining us, Laura Ram with us with FS Investments. Futures up eight. Churning futures with the VIX 17.62. I really want to note the two-year yield. On radio, it's really captured nicely on TV with a plunge intraday on the two-year yield, 3.98%. Laura, the uh, derivative specialist, Douglas Cass, emails in. Thanks, Doug, for watching this morning. And he really notes that we're starting to get to data points which become tail effective. You're expert at this with your foreign exchange heritage. We get out from the normal bell curve, a Gaussian curve, and with things like the empire manufacturing, we really get to get some instabilities in the tails which elevate risk. Do you agree with that? Are we where we have elevated tail risk? We absolutely are. Things like the uncertainty around banking, which has to me, mysteriously fallen off the radar of markets. But I think we really do need to pay attention to that. The fact that the debt ceiling, the timing is uncertain, which means that any sort of derivative structure, really, you know, normally we think of these things as sort of, you know, very time uh, relative. And the timing is so uncertain um, that Mm -hmm. I think it makes it all very hard to really structure something clear around an end date, and it means that we just get these fat tails that persist, and it could be for weeks more. Link in your dollar call to FS Investments Economic. Can you make a call, or is it just so muddy you don't want to go there? No, no. I think near term, we are facing some potentially fresh dollar weakness, and that's because you know, we do have, I think, the, the debt ceiling, you know, frustration is going to weigh on the dollar. I think right now the Fed uh, clearly being done while other central banks have more room to go. And finally, um, you know, the fact that we're still dealing with some banking headwinds, I think, are all conspiring to be a headwind for the dollar. I think the question is, how far does that go in a world where if there is truly some uh, flight to quality, we could see the dollar, you know, Mm -hmm. have a limited decline because of that sort of support underneath. Laura Rahm, thank you so much. With FS Investments, their chief economist, uh, great to be with us uh, this morning. Uh, Lisa, I want to go back to somewhat the instability that Doug Cass was alluding there. 
The Empire Manufacturing is a tertiary statistic. It's very good math out of Buffalo, New York, about manufacturing. Lots of feds of the 437 speakers today, they all have their favorite this week. Um, surveys in that. We've got to ask ourselves, why are we focusing on a tertiary statistic? And on a standard deviation basis with much volatility, the fact is it is getting stressful. It's not pandemic stressful. It's not 2008 stressful, but I'm sorry, it's nudging there. Can you, where are we going to be in 30 days if we see the continuation of these data points? The theme of today has been painful and <clears throat> trading range, and that's sort of what people are saying. And what we heard from Laura Rame really highlights that because, yes, it may be a tertiated, tertiary data point, but we don't have anything else. There's nothing else filling that void, so people are going to trade on it. And, oh, yeah, by the way, something else is going to give you a completely opposite read in terms of both strength and inflation. <clears throat> so what do you do? If the tail risks are both potentially yields going much higher, if there's an inflation <coughs> surprise, or much lower if we get you know, either yeah. some sort of deterioration in the economy or some sort of debt ceiling debacle where you do get some sort of technical default. What you do to frame the optimists is corporations adopt, uh, adjust. I see $39 billion of mergers today. Uh, people adapt. People adjust. The consumer keeps going for any number of reasons. And I'm going to go to Neil Dutta's optimism on inflation-adjusted incomes, maybe that provides the oomph against non-Gaussian vibrations. I just still can't get over that companies are almost bragging about being able to raise prices beyond inflation for consumers. <laughs> Look at how good our pricing power is. That's unusual for a cycle. And that really right. speaks, uh, speaks to the stickiness of inflation. Off the pandemic coming up for you nationwide, worldwide, Yana Lieber of the Metropolitan Transit Organization. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky had a surprise meeting with UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today. The British government says it will be providing Ukraine with hundreds of air defense missiles and hundreds of new long-range attack drones. The moment of challenges, the moment for us, for our society, our people, especially for our soldiers, moment is tough, difficult. Thank you very much for this package that you prepared. Great, huge, really uh, what can save the lives for our people. Thank you so much. Sunak says it's important for the Kremlin to know that, quote, we are here for the long term. Russia insists it is cutting oil production. At the same time, though, its seaborne crude oil flows to international markets continue to rise. Flows are now up by 10 percent since the first week of April, a new high for the period. Almost all of Russia's oil is going to China and India. The political fate of Turkey's president hangs in the balance as he may be headed for a runoff election in two weeks. Preliminary results show Recep Tayyip Erdogan with a lead of more than two million votes, which is not enough to avoid a second round. And that would pit him against opposition leader Kemal Kilik Derulu. Erdogan has been in power for two decades. And Vice Media has filed for bankruptcy protection and struck a deal to sell itself to creditors. That underscores the huge fall for the media upstart that was once valued at $5.7 billion. Creditors, including Fortress Investment Group, Soros Fund Management, and Monroe Capital, have agreed to buy Vice's assets for $225 million and assume significant liabilities. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. get people in the market, you really need to offer them something. And so I think, you know, that's why we run into this valuation limit around 4,200, because you add 10% to 4,200, all of a sudden you're at 4,600. And a lot of people aren't kind of comfortable with, you know, with that type of upside level. So yeah, we're, we're kind of bouncing into a ceiling at a floor effectively. Stuart Kaiser, really on fire today, really, really extraordinary with Citigroup, brought along t-shirts have something to do with Juventus and AC Milan and Italian football as well. But that was good swag, you know. It was, much... <laughs> it was our full 7 a.m. hour. We'll yeah, ask fantastic. him back. We'll ask him back. Yeah, we'll learn all of that. But what was there was okay. you got to be in the game. I mean, you know, uh, David Kotak was on Friday. He's 36% in cash running, you know, smaller shop. The bigger shops can't be 36% in cash. 
That's not how the game's played. Well, there's a real big question here <clears throat> as we trade between this range. What's going to be the post-pandemic rebound of other asset classes, and I think of commercial real estate, especially in some of the bigger cities at a time where we're kind of returning to work, but not fully just yet. And so to me, that's sort of a question, that unknown hanging out there uh, that sort of lurks beneath <clears throat> the surface of these public markets that are, that are really yeah. struggling for some sort of range. We are going to focus now, and for those of you internationally and national, this is coming to a city near you. We're going to focus on New York City and the five bureaus. Let me get your attention. There are 789 bridges in New York City. I can't believe I'm saying that, but that's the number. There's 24 movable bridges. Maybe there's four tunnels. Jano Lieber's with us right now. Jano, thank you so much for joining us. Chair, Chief Executive Officer of the MTA in charge of all this headache. I'm just going to go to one act, one incident, and Lisa Bramowitz is going to bring up others as well. I can't get up Madison Avenue anymore. When does the congestion end? Well, you know, you you said you said it exactly right, Tom. Congestion is we got to do something about it. Um, there's no choice. We can't. Have ambulances can't get to hospitals. <coughs> yes, Police can't yes, get to yes. Crimes in progress. It's out of control. <coughs> okay. So, what, what New York is doing is we're leading the nation. We're saying it's time to do something about it. We've got a congestion pricing plan. It's been tried all over the Western world, Stockholm, London, Singapore. Right. Um, and we're going to put it into effect. We don't have a choice. It's time to you know start doing aggressive action to deal with congestion and also to save the planet. We all know that's on the agenda. General, what's so important here, and I, I really bring this up, folks, living up near Mount Sinai, the privilege of living near Mount Sinai, where the ambulances can't get to the 101st Street emergency room. Let's. I want to go to the rapidity of this. London fixed this. Other cities have dealt with it. It's been a failure, say, in Mexico City or Manila. How fast can you free up the congestion in this marvelous city? It's a good question. We, we, we've, we've got the federal approval almost, almost done. We've been at this for a couple of years now. Trump, the Trump administration wouldn't let us deal with the environmental process the federal law requires. Biden administration let us get started two years ago. We've hit the milestones. Now we're going to be implementing it. We're literally going to start building out the infrastructure, the cameras, the sensors, to do it all in about a year. And then, Tom, you and I will right. watch as it starts to take effect on congestion, and hopefully to open up the roads. Lisa, my amateur take on this, and I mean amateurs, he said the cameras word, and that's the word nobody. London is cameras driven. New York is not. That's my guesstimate of how we begin to get there. Jeno, how much is this really an effort to try to bail out a subway system that has struggled through a pandemic and really still is not seeing its ridership come back? Well, the, you know, the, our operating budget, we have a, like an $18 billion operating budget, Lisa. We actually dealt with that with the governor's leadership uh, in, in the, the current budget year. We've actually dealt with it for a four-year plan period. So kudos to Governor Hochul and the New York State Legislature. Unlike many other places, we know that mass transit is the lifeblood of our city and our region. And it's for New Yorkers, it's like air and water. We can't survive without it. The governor and the state legislature stepped up. The money from congestion pricing, by contrast, is going to go to our capital budget, which allows us to maintain this 100-year-old-plus system, stuff that's that old wants to fall apart. you got to invest in it like any business would. It's a trillion-dollar asset, and we need the money to maintain it and to improve it. How is the uh, infrastructure changing and the allocations of that budget, Jano, given that ridership hasn't come back to its pre-pandemic level just yet? There's a question about whether it will in the same, at least in the near future, as a result of the work from home trends and the emptying out in certain parts of the office space. How do you allocate to a system that is the lifeblood and is struggling with a lot of issues right now, whether it's elevated crime, whether it's just uh, the general kind of buildup of filth. I'm sorry, I'm a native New Yorker, so this is something that I have seen over the years. How much are you going to try to uh, remedy that? Well, listen, first of all, let's, let's get straight on the safety issue. A crime in the subway system is down like 10% since last year. And given the rise in ridership over the same period, it's really down overall. We're back where we were roughly before the pandemic began in terms of the risk of being a victim of crime. There are like, you know, right. five to eight crimes on the subway system every day. And with the population four million right. right now, 
that's the size of the city of Los Angeles. So we're not ashamed of our safety record at all. It's actually pretty good. But Lisa's <clears throat> question is on the money. How do you get people back to, uh, to normal life? Interestingly, if you go apples to apples with pre-COVID, we're about <clears throat> close to 80%. Work from home is a factor. It's what's you know, pushed us down in terms of ridership. But there's so many people who use the subway system to go to school, to go, you know, to, go to medical right. appointments, just to live their lives. Same with the bus system. That We're, we're, we're on the move. We are very right. much in rising, and we've had 4 million rider days again and again in the last couple right. of weeks. It is headed in a good direction. General, this is a personal mission for me. I sit on Fifth Avenue, and it's a privilege to sit on Fifth Avenue. And I count the number of people on our city buses. Sometimes I see four people, sometimes I see 12 people, but many of those buses are empty. How do we fund free bus riding so that the bottom quintile of people in New York City can service the upper quintile? It's an outrage that we don't fix the transportation system of the poorest people in New York City. How do we do it? You know, Tom, the, the, the key is to have transit remain affordable. I think you're right. I, I don't know if free everything is the right answer. But transit is one of the few things that makes New York City affordable. It is literally like 10 percent the cost of owning an automobile. So we're really proud of that. It is one of the things that allows us to, to support our great, you know, working and middle class New York community. You know, the buses in Midtown that you're seeing, a lot of that is people can walk faster than they can than the bus can go because of that congestion. I'm convinced I grew up riding the bus. I'm convinced people are going to come back when we pick up the speed. Congestion pricing, bus lanes, bus right. camera enforcement are going to do that. What do you know about Lincoln Tunnel? For those of you internationally and worldwide, the tunnel system in New York in New York City is an outrage some of the hours of the day. When, I'm getting older watching this, Jana. When, when, you, when do we get another tunnel to relieve the burden? What can you do about it? What can the mayor do about it? You know, honestly, Tom, I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm not here to advocate for, uh, for expanding the access of automobiles and trucks into our central business district. Every time we build new capacity in that respect, it up. just fills up. So what we have to do is to build more and better mass transit. It's the way that we can continue to grow our economy and the population of our central business district, both workers and residents, um, without environmental consequences. Right. And, and that's where we're headed. We're making those investments. An update and an experiment for all the cities of the world. Uh, Jenna Lieber is with the MTA in uh, New York City. It's amazing there, Lisa. Thank you. The themes, the themes that, that we're done at, at, to every city in the world, some doing it right, some doing it wrong. To Thank me, it's, it's just a differential with London uh, right now. I mean, that's where I would go with it. Traditionally, you can rank cities according to who has the worst traffic, and I recently did this Please. for a variety of reasons. And it really hinges on just how good or bad their public transit system is. If they don't have an effective public transportation system, you can see people getting stuck in traffic for two, three <clears throat> hours to go, you know, 30 miles. And this is really a problem for, you know, basically anyone who wants to live there. So at what point do you have this real issue if suddenly the whole lifeblood was disrupted right. because of the pandemic? And there's an ambiguity about how much will naturally come back with commuters. It is an existential yeah. issue that's facing a lot of big cities in the world. I'm not informed on this, but basically Manhattan is a parking lot. I mean, there's, you know, not to make a joke about it, but you look at the old photos and there were lanes open. We're basically with this congestion. We're parking. There's lot. also a question of if you charge $23 for someone to come into the city, are they going to come? How much revenue oh, are you actually going to raise? Huge. Will this actually huge. really impede yeah. a certain inner borough kind of connectivity? There are a lot <clears throat> of questions here. Good. We're going to do that. Coming up, we'll have the transportation experts of Fargo and the Dakotas. <laughs> Very bad Talk public transportation there. Futures of <laughs> eight. Stay with us. Bostick in the two o'clock hour. Good morning.